Welcome back to Living Room Shakespeare. Uh, today we have The Winter's Tale. We are all very excited uh, to be bringing that to you tonight. Uh, oh my goodness, I love going live and then going blank. Oh, and I forgot my light. Look, I'm getting all kinds of help today. All right, let's start over. Welcome back to Living Room Shakespeare. We are so happy to be with you tonight. We have tonight's show and one more show in our season, uh, and then we're gonna be taking off for the summer. So please make sure to mark on your calendar for next Saturday night. We have Midsummer Night's Dream. So tonight is the Winter's Tale. Next Saturday is Midsummer Night's Dream. And then we will be off for uh, a little while this summer and we will uh, see when we get back to you. So uh, we have the Winter's Tale ready. The actors are in the wings. Uh, before we get started, I would like to remind you that the Center for Performing Arts in Rhinebeck is a theatrical home for many of our actors and they are in the process of building their outdoor stage. They put some great photos up today of the process of building the stage. Uh, we're very excited for them. Uh, so they are streaming Oedipus Rx this weekend and next weekend. I hear it's amazing. Make sure you get your streaming tickets for that. And then following that, they have, um, oh, I just blanked. Dance performances. They have, a, they have some dance performances. And, then as you like. and as you like it. That's right. Many of folks here are um, are involved in As You Like It. And I know at least Kevin is going to be in the dance performances. <laughs> so there's some great stuff coming up there. So please keep track of their schedule. Go see the shows. Hang out on the lawn while they're outside doing live performances this summer. And hopefully we'll see you there. And donate if you can. Donate if you can. Uh, the donation link is somewhere here on this post, so, or at their website. All right, now, uh, without further ado, uh, we bring you The Winter's Tale. This is uh, Act One, Scene One. If you shall chance, Camillo, to visit Bohemia on the like occasion whereon my services are now on foot, you shall see, as I have said, great difference between our Bohemia and your Sicilia. I think this coming summer, the King of Sicilia means to pay Bohemia the visitation which he justly owes him. <laughs> Wherein our entertainment shall shame us, we will be justified in our loves, for indeed, we beseech you. Verily, I speak it in the freedom of my knowledge. We cannot, with such magnificence and so rare, I know not what to say. We will give you sleepy drinks at your senses, unintelligent of our insufficience, may, though they cannot praise us, as little accuse us. You pay a great deal too dear for what's given freely. <laughs> Believe me, I speak as my understanding instructs me, and my honesty puts it to utterance. Cecilia cannot show himself over kind to Bohemia. They were trained together in their childhoods, and there rooted betwixt them then such an affection which cannot choose but branch now. Since their more mature dignities and royal necessities made separation of their society, their encounters, though not personal, have been royally attorneyed with interchange of gifts, letters, loving embassies, that they have seemed to be together, though absent, shook hands as over a vast, and embraced as if it were from the ends of opposed winds. The heavens continue their loves. I think there is not in the world either malice or matter to alter it. You have an unspeakable comfort in your young Prince Mamilius, is a gentleman of the greatest promise that ever came into my note. I very well agree with you in the hopes of him. It is a gallant child, one that indeed physics the subject, makes old hearts fresh. They that went on crutches ere he was born desire yet their life to see him a man. Would they else be content to die? Yes, if there were no other excuse why they should desire to live. If the king had no son, they would desire to live on crutches till he had one. Act one, scene two. Nine changes of the watery star hath been the shepherd's note since we've left our throne without a burden. Time as long again would be filled up, my brother, our thanks, and yet we should for perpetuity go hence in debt. And therefore, like a cipher, yet standing in a rich place, I multiply with one, we thank you, many thousands more that go before it. Ah, uh, stay your thanks a while and pay them when you part. 
Sir, that's tomorrow. I'm questioned by my fears of what may chance or breed upon our absence that may blow no sneaping winds at home to make us say, this is put forth too truly. Besides, I've stayed to tire your royalty. Oh, we are tougher, brother. Then you can put us to it. No longer stay. One seven night longer. Very sooth. Tomorrow. <laughs> we'll part the time betweens. Then, and in that, I'll no gainsaying. Press me not, beseech you. So there is no tongue that moves, none, none in the world, so soon as yours could win me. So should it now, were there necessity in your request? Although twere needful, I denied it. My affairs do even drag me homeward, which to hinder were in your love a whip to me, my stay to you and a charge and trouble. To save both, farewell our brother. Long time, our queen, speak you. I had thought, sir, to have held my peace until you had drawn oaths for him not to stay. You, sir, charge him too coldly. Tell him you are sure all in Bohemia's well. The satisfaction the bygone day proclaimed. Say this to him, he's beat from his best ward. Well said, Hermione. To tell he longs to see his son were strong, but let him say so then and let him go but let him swear so, and he shall not stay. We'll thwack him hence with distaffs. Yet of your royal presence, I'll adventure the borrow of a week. When at Bohemia you take my lord, I'll give him my commission to let him there a month behind the, the jest prefixed for this parting. Yet good deed, Leontes, I love thee not ajar the clock behind what lady she her lord. You'll stay? No, madam. Nay, but you will. I may not, verily. Verily? You put me off with limber vows. But I, though you would seek to unsphere the stars with oaths, should yet say, sir, no going. Verily, you shall not go. A lady's verily is as potent as a lord's. Will you go yet? Force me to keep you as a prisoner, not like a guest, so you shall pay your fees when you depart and save your thanks? How say you, my prisoner or my guest? By their dread verily, one of them you shall be. Your guest then, madam, to be your prisoner should impart offending, which is for me less easy to commit than you to punish. Not your jailer then, but your kind hostess. Come, I'll question you of my lord's tricks and yours when you were boys. You were pretty lordlings then. No, we were, fair queen. Two lads that thought there was no more behind but such a day tomorrow as today. And to be a boy eternal. Was not my lord the verier wag of the two? We were as twin labs, lambs that did frisk in the sun and bleed at one another. What we changed was innocence for innocence. We knew not the doctrine of ill-doing or dreamed that any did. Had we pursued that life, and our weak spirits ne'er been brought higher reared with stronger blood. We should have answered heaven boldly, not guilty. The imposition cleared hereditarily ours. By this we gather you have tripped since. <laughs> My sacred lady, temptations have since then been born to us. For in those unfledged day was my wife a girl. Your precious self had then not crossed the eyes of my young playfellow. Grace to boot. Of this make no conclusion, lest you say your queen and I are devils. Yet go on. The offenses we have made you do will answer. If you first sinned with us, and that with us you did continue fault, and that you slipped not with any but with us. Is he one yet? He'll stay, my lord. At my request, he would not. Hermione, my dearest, thou never spokest to better purpose. Never? Oh, never but once. What, have I twice said well? When was it before? I prithee tell me, crams with praise and makes us fat as teen things. One good deed dying, tongueless slaughters a thousand waiting upon that. Our praises are our wages. You may rise with one soft kiss, a thousand furlongs ere with spur we heat an acre. But to the goal, my last good deed was to entreat his stay. What was my first? It has an older sister, or I mistake you. Oh, would her name were Grace. But once before I spoke to the purpose, when? They let me have it. I long. Why, 
That was when three crabbed months had soured themselves to death, ere I could make thee open thy white hand and clap thyself, my love. Then did thou utter, I am yours forever. His grace indeed. Whom I lo you now, I have spoke to the purpose twice. The one forever earned a royal husband, the other for some while a friend. Too hot, too hot. To mingle friendship far as mingling bloods. I have tremor cordis on me. My heart dances, but not for joy, not joy. This entertainment may a free face put on, derive a liberty from hardiness, from bounty, fertile bosom, and well become the agent. It may I grant, but to be paddling palms and pinching fingers as now they are, and making practice smiles as in a looking glass, and then to sigh as twere the mort of the deer. Oh, that is entertainment my bosom likes not, nor my brows. Amelius, art thou my boy? I am my lord. Aye, fex. Why, that's my backcock. What hast smudged thy nose? They say it is a copy out of mine. Come, Captain, we must be neat, not neat, but cleanly, Captain. Art thou my calf? Yes, if you will, my lord. Thou wants a rough pash and the shoots that I have to be full like me. Yet they say we are almost as like as eggs. Women say so, that will say anything. But were they false, as dice are to be wished by one that fixes, no born twixt his and mine. Yet were it true to say this boy were like me. Come, Sir Page, look on me with your welkin eye. Sweet villain, most dearest, my collop. Can thy damn? May it be? Affection. Thy intention stabs the center. Thou dost make possible things not so held. Communications with dreams. How can this be? With what's unreal, thou coactive art, and fellows nothing. Then tis very credent. Thou mayest co-join with something, and thou dost. And that beyond commission, and I find it. And that to the infection of my brains and hardening of my brows. What means Cecilia? Something seems unsettled. How, my lord? What cheer? How's it with you, best brother? You look as if you held a brow of much distraction. Are you moved, my lord? No, in good earnest. How sometimes nature will betray its folly, its tenderness, and make itself a pastime to harder bosoms. Looking on the lines of my boy's face, methoughts I did recoil twenty-three years, and saw myself unbreached in my green velvet coat, my dagger muzzled, lest it should bite its master, and so prove, as ornaments oft do, too dangerous. How like, methought, I then was to this colonel, this squash, this gentleman, my honest friend. Will you take eggs for money? No, my lord, I'll fight. You will? Why, happy man, be so dull. My brother, are you so fond of your young prince as we do seem to be of ours? If at home, sir, he's all my exercise, my mirth, my matter, now my sworn friend, and then my enemy, my parasite, my soldier, statesman, statesman, all. He makes a July's day as short as December, and with his varying childness cures in me thoughts that would uh, thick my blood. <laughs> so stands this squire office with me. We too will walk, my lord, and leave you to your graver steps. Hermione, how thou lovest us show in our brother's welcome. Let what is dear in Sicily be cheap. Next to thyself and my young rover, he's apparent to my heart. You would seek us, we are yours in the garden. Shall I attend you there? To your own bents dispose you. You'll be found, be you beneath the sky. I am angling now, though you perceive me not how I give line. Go to, go to. How she holds up the neb, the bill to him, and arms her with the boldness of a wife to her allowing husband. Hmm. Gone already. Inch thick, knee deep overhead, and ears a forked one. Go play, boy, play. Thy mother plays, and I play too, but so disgraced a part whose issue will hiss me to my grave. Contempt and clamor will be my now. Go play, boy, play. There have been, or I am much deceived, cuckolds ere now. And many a man there is, even at this present, now while I speak this, holds his wife by the arm, 
that little thinks she has been sluiced in his absence, and his pond fished by his next neighbor, by Sir Smile, his neighbor. Nay, there is comfort in it. Whilst other men have gates and those gates opened as mine against their will, should all despair that have revolted wives, the tenth of mankind would hang themselves. Psychic for physic for there's none. It is a body planet that will strike where tis predominant and tis powerful, think it, from east, west, north, and south. Be it concluded no barricado for a belly. Know it, it will let in and out the enemy with bag and baggage. Many thousands on have the disease and feel it not. How now, boy? I am like you, they say. Aye, that's some comfort. What, Camillo there? Uh, aye, my good lord. Go play, Mamilius. Thou art, thou art an honest man. Camillo, this great sir will yet stay longer. You had much ado to make his anchor hold. When you cast out, it still came home. Didst note it? He would not stay at your petitions, made his business more material. Didst perceive it? They're here with me already, whispering, rounding. Cecilia is a so forth. Tis far gone when I shall gust it last. How came it, Camillo, that he did stay? At the good queen's entreaty. At the queen's, be it. Good, should be pertinent, but so it is, it is not. Was this taken by any understanding, pate but thine? For thy conceit is soaking, will draw in more than the common blocks. Not noted is it, but of the finer natures, by some severals of headpiece extraordinary? Lower messes, perchance, are to this business purblind? Say. Business, my lord? I think most understand Bohemia stays here longer. Ha! Stays here longer. Aye, but why? To satisfy your highness and the entreaties of her most gracious mistress. Satisfy? The entreaties of your mistress. Satisfy? Hmm. Interesting. My script didn't load the next page. Wild. Uh, going to refresh the page. This is all in Shakespearean. Just use your imaginations to... Uh, See the load. I did. My apologies, my good friend Camillo. But satisfy the entreaties of your mistress. Satisfy. Let that suffice. I have trusted thee, Camillo, with all the nearest things to my heart, as well my chamber counsels, wherein priest-like thou hast cleansed my bosom. I from thee departed, thy penitent reformed. But we have been deceived in thy integrity, deceived in that which seems so. Be it forbid, my lord. Abide upon it. Thou art not honest, or thou inclinest that way. Thou art a coward, which hoxes honestly behind, restraining from course required, or else thou must be counted, a servant grafted in my serious trust, and therein negligent, or else a fool that seest a game played home, the rich stake drawn, and talkest all for jest. My gracious lord. I may be negligent, foolish, and fearful. In every one of these, no man is free. But that his negligence, his folly, fear among the infinite doings of the world sometime puts forth. In your affairs, my lord, if ever I were willful negligent, it was my folly. If industriously I played the fool, it was my negligence, not weighing well the end. If ever fearful to do a thing where I the issue doubted, whereof the execution did cry out against the non-performance, it was a fear which oft infects the wisest. <laughs> These, my lord, are such allowed infirmities that honesty is never free of. But beseech your grace, be plainer with me. Let me know my trespass by its own visage. If I then deny it, tis none of mine. Have not you seen, Camillo, but that's past doubt. You have, or your eyeglass is thicker than a cuckold's horn or heard, for to a vision so apparent, rumor cannot be mute or thought, for cogitation resides not in that man that does not think. My wife is slippery? If thou wilt confess, or else be impudently negative to have nor 
to have nor eyes nor ears nor thought then say my wife's a hobby horse deserves a name as rank as any flax wench that puts to before her troth plight say it and justify it. i would not be a stander by to hear my sovereign mistress clouded so without my present vengeance taken true my heart you never spoke what did become you less than this which to reiterate were sin as deep as that though true is whispering nothing is leaning cheek to cheek is meeting noses kissing with inside lips stopping the career of laughter with a sigh a note infallible of breaking honesty horsing foot on foot skulking in corners wishing clocks more swift hours minutes moon, noon midnight and all eyes blind with the pin and web but theirs theirs only that would unseen be wicked is this nothing why and the world and all that's in it is nothing the covering sky is nothing, Bohemia nothing, my wife is nothing, nor nothing have these nothings if this be nothing. Good my lord, be cured of this diseased opinion and betimes, for it is most dangerous. Say it be, tis true. No, no, my lord. It is, you lie, you lie. I say thou sly, Camillo, and I hate thee. Pronounce thee a gross lout, a mindless slave, or else a hovering temporizer that canst with thine eyes at once see good and evil, inclining to them both. Were my wife's liver infected as her life, she would not live the running of one glass. Who does infect her? Why, he that wears her like a metal, hanging above his neck, Bohemia, who, if I had servants true about me, that bear eyes to see alike mine honor as their prophets, their own particular thrifts, they would do that which should undo more doing. I and thou, his cupbearer, whom I from meaner form have benched and reared to worship, who mayest see plainly as heaven sees earth and earth sees heaven, how I am galled, might bespice a cup to give mine enemy a lasting wink, which draft to me were cordial. Sir, my lord, I could do this, and that with no rash potion, but with a lingering dram that should not work maliciously like poison. But I cannot believe this crack to be in my dread mistress, so sovereignly being honorable. I have loved thee. Make that thy question and go rot. Dost think I am so muddy, so unsettled to appoint myself in this vexation, sully the purity and whiteness of my sheets? which to preserve is sleep, which being spotted is goads, thorns, nettles, tails of wasps. Give scandal to the blood of the prince, my son, who I do think is mine and love as mine, without right moving to it. Would I do this? Could man so blench? I must believe you, sir. Hmm. I do. Hmm. And will fetch off Bohemia for it, provided hmm. that when he's removed, your highness will take again your queen as yours at first, even for your son's sake, and thereby for sealing the injury of tongues in courts and kingdoms known and allied to yours. Thou dost advise me, even so as I mine own course have set down. I'll give no blemish to her honor. None. My lord, go then, and with a countenance as clear as friendship wears at feasts, Keep with Bohemia and with your queen. I am his cupbearer. If from me he have wholesome beverage, account me not your servant. This is all. Do it, and thou hast the one half of my heart. Do it not, thou splits thine own. I'll do it, my lord. I will, see, I will seem friendly, as thou hast advised me. Oh, miserable lady. But for me, what case stand I in? I must be the poisoner of good Polixenes, and my ground to do it is the obedience to a master, one who in rebellion with himself will have all that are his so too. To do this deed, promotion follows. If I could find example of thousands that had struck anointed kings and flourished after, I'd not do it. But since nor brass, nor stone, nor parchment bears not one, let villainy itself forswear it. I must forsake the court. 
to do it or no is certain to me a breakneck. Happy star rain now. Here comes Bohemia. Strange. <clears throat> Methinks my favor here begins to warp. Not speak. Good day, Camillo. Uh, hail, most royal sir. What is the news of the court? None rare, my lord. The king hath on him such a countenance as he had lost some province in a region loved as he loves himself. Even now I met him with customary compliment when he, wafting his eyes to the contrary and falling a lip of much contempt, speeds for me and so leaves me to consider what is breeding that changes thus his manners. I dare not know, my lord. How dare not? Do not? Do know and dare not? Be intelligent to me. Tis thereabouts. For to yourself what you do know you must and, and cannot say you dare not. Good Camillo, your changed complexions are to me a mirror which shows me mine changed too. For I must be a party in this alteration, finding myself thus altered with it. <laughs> There is a sickness which puts some of us in distemper, but I cannot name the disease, and it is caught of you that yet are well. How caught of me? Make me not sighted like the basilisk. I have looked on thousands who have sped the better by my regard, but killed none so. Camillo, as you are certainly a gentleman, <laughs> there too, if you know aught which does behoove my knowledge, Thereof to be informed, imprisoned it not in ignorant concealment. I may not answer. Mm -hmm. A sickness caught of me, and yet I well. I'm, I must be answered. Dost thou hear, Camillo? I conjure thee by all the parts of man which honor does acknowledge, whereof does the whereof the least is not this suit of mine, that thou declare what incidency dost Thou dost guess of harm is creeping toward me. How far off, how near, which way to be prevented, if to be, if not, how best to bear it? Sir, I will tell you, since I am charged in honor and by him that I think honorable, therefore mark my counsel, which must be in as swiftly followed as I mean to utter it, or both yourself and me cry lost. And so good night. On, good Camilla. I am appointed him to murder you. By whom, Camilla? By the king. For what? He thinks, nay, with all confidence, he swears, as he had seen it, or been an instrument to vice you to it, that you have touched his queen forbiddenly. Oh, then my best blood turned to an infected jelly, and my name be yoked with his that did betray the best. Turn then my freshest reputation to a savor that may strike the dullest nostril where I arrive, and my approach be shunned, nay, hated too worse than the greatest infection that e'er was heard or read. Swear his thought over by each particular star in heaven and by all their influences, you may as well forbid the sea for to obey the moon as or by oath remove or counsel shake the fabric of his folly whose foundation is piled upon his faith and will continue the standing of his body. How should this grow? I know not, but I am sure tis safer to avoid what's grown than question how tis born. If therefore you dare trust my honesty that lies enclosed in this trunk, which you shall bear along in pawn, away tonight, your followers I will whisper to the business and will by twos and threes at several posterns clear them of the city. For myself, I'll put my fortunes to your service, which are here by this discovery lost. Be not uncertain, for by the honor of my parents I have uttered truth which if you seek to prove, I dare not stand by, nor shall you be safer than one condemned by the king's own mouth, thereon his execution sworn. 
do believe thee. I saw his heart in his face. Give me thy hand. Be pilot to me, and in thy places shall still neighbor mine. My ships are ready. My people did expect my hence departure two days ago. This jealousy is for a precious creature. As she's rare, must it be great. And as his person's mighty, must it be violent. And as he does conceive, he is dishonored by a man who ever professed to him. Why, his revenges must in that be made more bitter. Furor shades me. Good expedition be my friend and comfort the gracious queen. Part of his theme, but nothing of his ill-taken suspicion. Come, Camillo, I will respect thee as a father if thou bearest my life off hence. Let us avoid. It is in mine authority to command the keys of all the posterns. Please your highness to take the urgent hour. Come, sir, away. Act two, scene one. What wisdom stirs amongst you? Come, sir, now I implore you again. Pray you sit by us and tell the tale. Merry or sad shall be? As merry as you will. A sad tale's best for winter. I have one of sprites and goblins. Let's have that, good sir. Come on, sit down. Come on and do your best to fright me with your sprites. You're powerful at it. There was a man. Nate, come sit down. Then on. Dwelt by a churchyard. I will tell it softly. Yon crickets shall not hear it. Come on then, and give it to me in mine ear. Was he met there? His train? Camellio with him? Behind the tuft of pines I met them. Never saw a man so scour on their way. I eyed them even to their ships. How blessed am I in my just censure, in my true opinion. Alack, for lesser knowledge, how accursed in being so blessed. There may be in the cup a spider steeped, and one may drink, depart, and yet partake no venom, for his knowledge is not infected. But if one present, the abhorred ingredient to his eye make known, how he hath drunk, he cracks his gorge, his sides with violent hefts. I have drunk and seen the spider. Camillo, with his help in this, his pander. There is a plot against my life, my crown. All's true that is mistrusted. That false villain whom I employed was pre-employed by him. He has discovered my design, and I remained a pinched thing. Yea, a very trick for them to play at will. How came the postern so easily open? By his great authority, which often hath no less prevailed than so on your command. I know it too well. Give me the boy. I'm glad you did not nurse him, though he does bear some signs of me. Yet you have too much blood in him. Is this sport? Bear the boy hence. He shall not come about her. Away with him. And let her sport herself with that she's big with. For tis Polixenes has made thee swell thus. I'd say he had not, and I'll be sworn you would believe my, my saying. How are you lean to the name word? You, my lord, look on her, mark her well. Be but about to say she is a goodly lady, and the justice of your heart will thereto add, tis pity she's not honest, honorable. Praise her, but for this, her without door form, which on my faith deserves high speech and straight the shrug, the hum or ha, these petty brands that calumny doth use. Oh, I am out, that mercy does, for calumny will sear virtue itself. These shrugs, these hums and ha's, when you have said she's goodly, come between ere you can say she's honest. But be it known, from him that has most cause to grieve it should be, she's an adulteress. Should a villain say so, the most replenished villain in the world, he were as much more villain. You, my lord, do but mistake. You have mistook, my lady. Polixenes for Leontes. O oh, thou thing, which I'll not call a creature of thy place, lest barbarism make me the precedent, should a like language use to all degrees, and mannerly distinguishment leave out betwixt the prince and beggar. I have said, she's an adulteress. I have said with whom more she's a traitor and Camillo is a federary with her 
and one that knows what she should shame to know herself, but with her most vile principle, and that she's a bedswerver, even as bad as those that vulgars give bold titles, ay, and privy to this their late escape. No, by my life, privy to none of this. How will this grieve you when you shall come to clearer knowledge that you have thus half published me? Gentle, my lord, you scarce can write me thoroughly than to say you did mistake. No. If I mistake in those foundations which I build upon, the center is not big enough to bear a schoolboy's top. Away with her to prison. He who shall speak for her is afar off guilty, but that he speaks. There's some ill planet reigns. I must be patient till the heavens look with an aspect more favorable. Good my lords, I am not prone to weeping as our sex commonly are, the want of which vain dew perchance shall dry your pities. But I have that honorable grief lodged here, which burns worse than tears drown. Beseech you all, my lords, with thoughts so qualified as your charity shall best instruct you, measure me, and so the king's will be performed. Shall I be heard? Who is that goes with me? Beseech your highness, my women may be with me, for you see my plight requires it. Do not weep, good fools. There is no cause when, when you shall know your mistress has deserved prison, then abound in tears as I come out. This action I now go on is for my better grace. And you, my lord, I never wish to see you sorry. Now I trust I shall. Go, do our bidding, hence. Beseech your highness, call the queen again. Be certain what you do, sir, lest your justice prove violence in which three great ones suffer, yourself, your queen, your son. For her, my lord, I dare lay down my life and will do it, sir, please you to accept it. The queen is spotless in the eyes of heaven and to you. I mean, in this which you accuse her. It proves she's otherwise. I'll keep my stables where I lodge my wife. I'll go in couples with her. Then when I feel and see her, no farther trust her. For every inch of woman in the world, I every dram of woman's flesh is false if she be. Hold your pieces. Good, my lord. It is for you to speak, not for ourselves. You are abused, and by some put her on that will be damned for it. Would I knew the villain. Cease, no more. You smell this business with a sense as cold as is a dead man's nose. But I do see it and feel it as you feel doing thus, and see with all the instruments that feel. It be so. We need no grave to bury honesty. There's not a grain of it in the face to sweeten of the whole dunny earth. What? Lack I credit. I had rather you did lack it than I, my lord, upon this ground. And more it would content me to have her honor true than your suspicion. Be blamed for it how you might. Why? What need we commune with you of this, but rather follow our forceful instigation? Our prerogative calls not your counsels, but our natural goodness imparts this, which if you, or stupefied or seeming so in, still, in skill, cannot or will not relish a truth like this, inform yourselves. We need no more of your advice. The matter, the loss, the gain, the ordering on tis is all properly ours. And I wish, my liege, you had only in your silent judgment tried it without more overture. How could that be? Either thou art most ignorant by age or thou wert born a fool. Camillo's flight added to their familiarity which was as gross as ever touched conjecture, that lacked sight only, not for approbation, but only seeing all other circumstances made up to the, de the deed, doth push on this proceeding, yet for a greater confirmation, for in an act of this importance, twere most piteous to be wild. I have dispatched in post to sacred Delphos, to Apollo's temple, Cleomenes and Dion, whom you know of stuffed sufficiency. Now from the oracle they will bring all, whose spiritual counsel had shall stop or spur me. Have I done well? Well done, my lord. Though I am satisfied and need no more than what I know, 
Yet shall the oracle give rest to the minds of others, such as he whose ignorant credulity will not come up to the truth. So have we thought it good from our free person she should be confined, lest that the treachery of the two fled hence be left her to perform. Come, follow us. We are to speak in public, for this business will raise us all. After as I take it, if the good truth were known. Act two, scene two. The keeper of the prison, call to him. Let him have knowledge who I am. Good lady, no court in Europe is too good for thee. What dost thou then in prison? Now, good sir, you know me, do you not? For a worthy lady and one who I much honor. Pray you then conduct me to the queen. I may not, madam. To the contrary, I have expressed commandment. Here's a do to lock up honesty and honor from the access of gentle visitors. Is it lawful, pray you, to see her women? Any of them, Amelia? So please you, madam, to put apart these your attendants, I shall bring Amelia forth. I pray now, call her. And madam, I must be present at your conference. Well, be it so, prithee. Here's much ado to make no stain as stain as passes coloring. Dear gentlewoman, how fair is our gracious lady? As well as one so great and so forlorn may hold together. On her frights and griefs, which never tender lady hath borne greater, she is something before her time delivered. A boy. A daughter and a goodly babe, lusty and like to live. The queen receives much comfort in it, says, my poor prisoner, I am innocent as you. I dare be sworn. These dangerous, unsafe loons in the king beshrew them. He must be told on it, and he shall. The office becomes a woman best. I'll take it upon me. If I prove honey-mouthed, let my tongue blister, and never to my red-looked anger be the trumpet any more. Pray you, Amelia, commend my best obedience to the queen. If she dares trust me with her little babe, I'll show it the king and undertake to be the advocate to the loudest. We do not know how he may soften at the sight of the child. The silence often of pure innocence persuades when speaking fails. Most worthy madam, your honor and your goodness is so evident that your free undertaking cannot miss a thriving issue. There is no lady living so meet for this great errand. Please your ladyship to visit the next room. I'll presently acquaint the queen of your most noble offer, who but today hammered of this design, but durst not tempt a minister of honor lest she should be denied. Tell her, Amelia, I'll use that tongue I have. If wit flow from it as boldness from my bosom, let not be doubted, I shall do good. I'll be you blessed for it. I'll to the queen. Please, you come something nearer. Madam, if it please the queen to send the babe, I know not what I shall incur to pass it, having no warrant. You need not fear it, sir. This child was prisoner to the womb and is by law and process of great nature thence freed and enfranchised, not a party to the anger of the king, nor guilty of, if any be, the trespass of the queen. I do believe it. Do not you fear. Upon mine honor, I will stand betwixt you in danger. Act two, scene three. Nor night, nor day, no rest. It is but weakness to bear the matter thus, mere weakness. If the cause were not in being part of the cause, she the adulteress, for the harlot king is quite beyond mine arm. Out of the blank and level of my brain, plot, poof, proof, but she I can hook to me, say that she were gone given to the fire, a moiety of my rest, might come to me again. Who's there? My lord. Uh, how does the boy? He took good rest tonight. Tis hope his sickness is discharged. To see his nobleness, conceiving the dishonor of his mother. He straight declined, drooped, took it deeply, fastened and fixed the shame on it in, in himself, threw off his spirit, his appetite, his sleep, and downright languished. Leave me solely. Go. See how he fares. Fie, fie, no thought of him. The very thought of my revenges that way recoil upon me. 
in himself too mighty, and in his parties his alliance. Let him be until a time may serve. For present vengeance, take it on her. Camillo and Polixenes laugh at me, make their pastime at my sorrow. They should not laugh if I could reach them, nor shall she within my power. You must not enter. Nay, rather, good my lords, be second to me. Fear you his tyrannous passion more, alas, than the queen's life? A gracious, innocent soul, more free than he is jealous. That's enough. Madam, he hath not slept tonight. Commanded none should come at him. Not so hot, good sir. I come to bring him sleep. To such as you that creep like shadows by him and do sigh at each his needless heavings, such as you nourish the cause of his awakening. I do come with words as medicinal as true, honest as either, to purge him of that humor that presses him from sleep. What noise there, ho? Oh. No noise, my lord, but needful conference about some gossips for your highness. How? Away with that audacious lady. Antigonus, I charge thee that sh she should not come about me. I knew she would. I told her so, my lord, on your displeasure's peril and on mine. She should not visit you. What, canst not rule her? From all dishonesty, he can. In this, unless he take the course that you have done, commit me for committing honor. Trust it, he shall not rule me. La, you now, you hear? When she will take the rein, I let her run. She'll not stumble. Good, my liege, I come. And I beseech you hear me, who professes myself your loyal servant, your physician, your most obedient counselor, yet that dares less appear so in comforting your evils than such as most seem yours. I say I come from your good queen. Good queen? Good queen, my lord, good queen, I say good queen, and would by combat make her good, so were I a man the worst about you. Force her hence. Let him that makes but trifles of his eyes first hand me. On mine accord, I'll off, but first I'll do my errand. The good queen, for she is good, hath brought you forth a daughter. Here tis, commends it to your blessing. Out! A mankind witch, hence with her out of the door, a most intellecting bawd. Not so. I am as ignorant in that as you in so entitling me, and no less honest than you are mad, which is enough, I'll warrant, as this world goes to pass for honest. Traitors, will you not push her out? Give her the bastard, thou dotard. Thou art woman tired, unroosted by thy dame partlet here. Take up the bastard, take it up, I say, give it to thy crone. Forever unvenerable be thy hands, if thou takest up the princess by that forced baseness which he has put upon it. He dreads his wife. So I would you did. Then twere past all doubt you'd call your children yours. A nest of traitors. I am none by this good light. Nor I, nor any but one that's here, and that's himself. For the sacred honor of himself, his queens, his hopeful sons, his babes betrays to slander, whose sting is sharper than the swords and will not, for as the case now stands, it is a curse, he cannot be compelled to it. Once remove the root of his opinion, which is rotten as ever oak or stone was sound. A coward of boundless tongue, who late hath beat her husband and now baits me. This brat is none of mine. It is the issue of Polixenes, Polixenes. Hence with it, and together with the dam, commit them to the fire. It is yours. And might we lay the old proverb to your charge, so like you tis the worse. Behold, my lord, although the print be little, the whole matter and copy of her, the father, eye, nose, lip, the trick of frown, his forehead, nay, the valley, the, the pretty dimples of his chin and cheek, his smiles, the very mold and frame of hand, nail, finger. And thou, good goddess nature, which hast made it so like to him that got it, if thou hast the ordering of the mind too, amongst all colors, no yellow in it, 
she suspect, as he does, her children, not her husband's. A gross hag. And Losel, thou art worthy to be hanged. Thou wilt not stay her tongue. Hang all the husbands that cannot do that feat. Don't leave yourself hardly one subject. Once more, take her hence. A most unworthy and unnatural lord can do no more. I'll have thee burnt. I care not. It is an heretic that makes the fire, not she which burns it. I'll not call you tyrant, but this most cruel usage of your queen, not able to produce more accusation than your own weak hinged fancy, something savors of tyranny and will ignoble make you, yea, scandalous to the world. On your allegiance, out of the chamber with her, were I a tyrant, where were her life? She durst not call me so if she did know me one. Away with her. I pray you do not push me. I'll be gone. Look to your babe, my lord. Tis yours. Jove send her a better guiding spirit. What needs these hands? You that are thus so tender or his followers will never do him good. Not one of you. Not one of you. So, so. Farewell. We are gone. Thou, traitor has set on thy wife this. My child, away with it. Even thou that hast a heart so tender over it, take it hence and see it instantly consumed with fire. Even thou and none but thou, take it up straight. Within this hour, bring me word tis done and by good testimony or I'll seize thy life and what thou else callest thine. If thou refuse and wilt encounter with my wrath, say so. The bastard brains with these, my proper hands, shall I dash out. Go, take it to the fire, for thou settest on thy wife. I did not, sir. Your liars all. Beseech your highness, give us better credit. We have always truly served you, and beseech so esteem of us. And on our knees, we beg as recompense of our dear services past and to come that you do change this purpose, which is being so horrible, so bloody, must lead to some foul issue. We now kneel. I am a feather for each wind that blows. Shall I live on to see this bastard kneel and call me father? Better burn it now than curse it then. But be it, let it live. It shall not neither. You, sir, come you hither, you that had been so tenderly officious with Lord Marjorie, your midwife there, to save this bastard's life, for tis a bastard, so sure as this beard's grey, what will you adventure to save this brat's life? Anything, my lord, that my ability may undergo and nobleness impose, at least thus much, I'll pawn the little blood which I have left to save the innocent, anything possible. It shall be possible. Swear by this sword that thou wilt perform my bidding. I will, my lord. Mark and perform it. Cease thou, for the frail of any point in it sh shall not only be death to thyself, but to thy lewd tongued wife, for whom this time we pardon. We enjoin thee, as thou art liegeman to us, that thou carry this female bastard hence, and that thou bear it to some remote and desert place quite quiet out of our dominions, and that there thou leave it without more mercy to its own protection and favor of the climate. As by stranger fortune it came to us, I do in justice charge thee on thy soul's peril and thy body's torture, that thou commend it strangely to some place where chance may nurse or end it. Take it up. I swear to do this, though a present death had been more merciful. Come, poor babe. Some powerful spirit instruct the kites and ravens to be thy nurses. Wolves and bears, they say, casting their savageness aside, have done like offices of pity. Sir, be prosperous in more than this deed does require. Blessing against this cruelty fight on thy side. Poor thing, condemned to loss. No, I'll not rear another's issue. 
Please, your highness, posts from those you sent to the Oracle are come an hour since. Cleomenes and Dion, being well arrived from Delphos, are both landed, hasting to the court. So please you, sir, their speed hath been beyond account. Twenty-three days they have been absent. His good speed foretells the great Apollo suddenly will have the truth of this appear. Prepare you, Lord. Summon a session that we may arraign our most disloyal lady, for as she hath been publicly accused, so shall she have a just and open trial. While she lives, my heart will be a burden to me. Leave me and think upon my bidding. Act three, scene one. The climate's delicate, the air most sweet, fertile, the isle, the temple much surpassing the common phrase it bears. Oh. I shall report, for it most caught me, the celestial habits, methinks I should so term them, and the reverence of the grave wearers, oh, the sacrifice, how ceremonious, solemn, and unearthly it was, offering. But of all, the burst and the ear-deafening voice of the oracle, kin to Jove's thunder, so surprised my sense that I was nothing. Well, if the event of the journey prove as successful as the queen, oh, be it so, as it hath been to us, rare, pleasant, speedy, the time is worth the use on it. Great Apollo, turn all to the best. These proclamations so forcing faults upon Hermione, I little like. Well, the violent carriage of it will clear or end the business when the oracle, thus by Apollo, great divine sealed up, shall the contents discover. Well, something rare even then will rush to acknowledge. Go, fresh horses, and gracious be the issue. Act three, scene two. This sessions, to our great grief we pronounce, even pushes against our heart. The party tried the daughter of a king, our wife, and one of us too much beloved. Let us be cleared of being tyrannous, since we so openly proceed in justice, which shall have due course even to the guilt or the purgation produce the prisoner. It is his highness's pleasure that the queen appear in person here in court. Silence. Read the indictment. Hermione, queen to the worthy Leontes, king of Sicilia, thou art here accused and arraigned of high treason in committing adultery with Polynixes, king of Bohemia, and in conspiring with Camillo to take away the life of our sovereign lord, the king, thy royal husband. The pretense whereof being by circumstance partly laid open, thou, Hermione, contrary to the faith and allegiance of a true subject, didst counsel and aid them for their better safety to fly away by night. Since what I am to say must be but that which contradicts my accusation and the testimony on my part no other but what comes from myself, it shall scarce boot me to say not guilty. Mine integrity being counted falsehood shall as I express it be so received. But thus, if powers divine behold our human actions as they do, I doubt not then but innocence shall make false accusation blush and tyranny tremble at patience. You, my lord, best know whom least will seem to do so. My past life hath been as continent, as chaste, as true as I am now unhappy, which is more than history can pattern, though devised and played to take spectators. For behold me, a fellow of the royal bed, which owe a moiety of the throne, a great king's daughter, the mother to a hopeful prince, here standing to prate and talk for life and honor for who please to come and hear. For life I prize it as I wait grief, which I would spare. For honor, Tis a derivative from me to mine, and only that I stand for. I appeal to your own conscience, sir, before Polixenes came to your court, how I was in your grace. How merited took to be so, since he came with what encounter so uncurrent I have strained to appear thus. 
if one jot beyond the bound of honor or in act or will that way inclining hardened be the hearts of all that hear me and my nearest of kin cry fie upon my grave i never heard yet that any of these bolder vices wanted less impudence to gainsay what they did then to perform it first that's true enough so tis a saying sir not due to me you will not own it more than mistress of which comes to me in name of fault, I must not at all acknowledge. For Polixenes, with whom I am accused, I do confess I loved him as in honor he required, with such kind of love as might become a lady like me, as yourself commanded, which not to have done, I think, had been in me both disobedience and ingratitude to you and toward your friend, whose love had spoke even since it could be speak from an infant freely that was yours. Now, for conspiracy, I know not how it tastes, though it be dished for me to try how. All I know of it is that Camilla was an honest man, and why he left your court, the gods themselves wanting no more than I are ignorant. You knew of his departure, as you know what you have undertaken to do in his absence. Oh, you speak a language that I understand not. My life stands in the level of your dreams, which I'll lay down. Your actions are my dreams. You had a bastard by Polixides, and I but dreamed it, as you were past all shame. Those of your fact are so, so past all truth, which to deny concerns more than avails. For as thy brat hath been cast out, like to itself, no father owning it, which is indeed more criminal in thee than it, so thou shalt feel our justice, in whose easiest passage look for no less than death. Sir, spare your threats. This bug which you would fright me with, I seek. To me can life be no commodity. The crown and comfort of my life, your favor I do give lost, for I do feel it gone. But know not how it went. My second joy and first fruits from my body, from his presence I am barred like one infectious. My third comfort, starred most unluckily, is from my breast. The innocent milk in its most innocent mouth hailed out to murder. Myself on every post proclaimed a strumpet with immodest hatred, the childbed privilege denied, which longs to women of all fashion. Lastly, hurried here to this place in the open air before I have got strength of limit. Now, my liege, tell me what blessings I have here alive that I should fear to die. Therefore, proceed. But yet, hear this. Mistake me not. No life. I prize it not a straw, but for mine honor, which I would free, I shall be condemned upon surmises. All proof sleeping else, but what your jealousies awake. I tell you, tis rigor and not law. Your honor's all. I do refer me to the oracle. Apollo be my judge. This your request is altogether just. Therefore bring forth and in Apollo's name his oracle. The emperor of Russia was my father. Oh, that he were alive and here beholding his daughter's trial, that he did but see the flatness of my misery with eyes of pity, not revenge. You here shall swear upon this sword of justice, that you, Cleomenes and Dion, have both been at Delphos, and from thence have brought this sealed up oracle by the hand delivered of great Apollo's priest. And since then you have not dared to break the holy seal, nor read the secrets in. All this we swear. Break up the seals and read. Hermione is chaste, Polynices blameless, Camilla a true subject, 
Leontes a jealous tyrant, his innocent babe truly begotten, and the king shall live without an heir if that which is lost be not found. Now blessed be the great Apollo. Hast thou read truth? Aye, my lord, even so as it is here set down. There is no truth at all in the oracle. The sessions shall proceed. This is mere falsehood. My lord, the king, the king. What is the business? Oh, sir, I shall be hated to report it. The prince, your son, with mere conceit and fear of the queen's speed is gone. How? Gone? Is dead. Apollo's angry and the heavens themselves do strike at my injustice. How now there? This news is mortal to the queen. Look down and see what death is doing. Take her hence, her heart is but overcharged. She will recover. I have too much believed mine own suspicion. Beseech you, tenderly apply to her some remedies for life. Apollo, pardon my great profaneness against thine oracle. I'll reconcile me to Polixenes, new woo my queen. Recall the good Camillo, whom I proclaim a man of truth, of mercy. For, being transported by my jealousies to bloody thoughts and to revenge, I chose Camillo for the minister to poison my friend Polixenes, which have been done. But that the good mind of Camillo tardied my swift command, though I with death and with reward did threaten and encourage him, not doing it and being done. He, most humane and filled with honor, to my kingly guest unclasped my practice, quit his fortunes here, which you knew great, and to the hazard of all uncertainties himself commended, no richer than his honor. How he glisters through my rust, and how his piety does my deeds make the blacker. Woe the while, oh cut my lace, lest my heart cracking it break too. What fit is this, good lady? What studied torments, tyrant, hast for me? What wheels, racks, fires? What flame, boiling in leads or oils? What older, newer torture must I receive whose every word deserves to taste of thy most worst? Thy tyranny, together working with thy jealousies, fancies too weak for boys, too green and idle for girls of nine, Oh, think what they have done and then run mad indeed, stark mad for all thy bygone fooleries were but spices of it. That thou betrayedst Polixenes, twas nothing. That thou did but show thee of a fool, inconstant and damnable, ingrateful. Nor was it much thou wouldst have poisoned good Camelo's honor to have him kill a king. Poor trespass is more monstrous standing by, whereof I reckon the casting forth to crows thy baby daughter to be none or little, though a devil would have shed water out of fire ere done it, nor is directly laid to thee the death of the young prince, whose honorable thoughts, thoughts high for one so tender, cleft the heart that could conceive a gross and foolish sire blemished his gracious dam. This is not, no, laid to thy answer, but the last, O Lord, when I have said, cry woe, well, the queen, the queen, the sweetest, dearest creature is dead, <laughs> and vengeance for it not drop down yet. The higher powers forbid. I say she's dead, I'll swear. It. If word nor oath prevail not, go and see. If you can bring tincture or luster in her lip, her eye, heat outwardly, or breath within, I'll serve you as I would do the gods. But, O oh, thou tyrant, do not repent these things, for they are heavier than all thy woes can stir. Therefore, betake thee to nothing but despair. A thousand knees, 10,000 years together, naked, fasting upon a barren mountain and still winter in storm perpetual could not move the gods to look that way thou wert. Go on, go on. Thou canst not speak too much. I had deserved all tongues to talk their bitterest. Say no more. However the business goes, you have made fault to the boldness of your speech. I'm sorry for it. All faults I make, 
when I shall come to know them, I do repent. Alas, I have showed too much the rashness of a woman. He is touched to the noble heart. What's gone and what's past help should be past grief. Do not receive affliction at my petition. I beseech you rather, let me be punished that have minded you of what you should forget. Now, good my liege, sir, royal sir, forgive a foolish woman. The love I bore your queen, <laughs> low fool again, I'll speak of her no more, nor of your children. <laughs> I'll not remember you of my own Lord who is lost too. <laughs> Take your patience to you and I'll, I'll say nothing. I did speak but well when most the truth, which I receive much better than to be pitied of thee. Prithee, bring me to the dead bodies of my queen and son. One grave shall be for both. Upon them shall the causes of their death appear unto our shame perpetual. Once a day I'll visit the chapel where they lie, and tears shed there shall be my recreation. So long as nature will bear up with this exercise, so long I daily vow to use it. Come and lead me to these sorrows. Act three, scene three. Thou art perfect then, the ship hath touched upon the deserts of Bohemia? Ay, my lord, and fear we have landed in any time. Skies look grimly and threaten present blessed. My con. The heavens with that we have in hand are angry and frown upon us. Sacred wills be done. Go, get aboard, look to thy back. I'll not be long before I call upon thee. Make your best haste and go not too far in the land. Tis like to be loud weather. Besides, this place is famous for the creatures of prey that keep on it. Go thou away, I'll follow instantly. I'm glad it's hard to be so rid of the business. Come, poor babe. I have heard, but not believed. Spirits of the dead may walk again. If such thing be, thy mother appeared to me last night. For ne'er was dream so like waking. To me comes a creature, sometimes her head on one side, sometimes on another. I never saw a vessel of like sorrow, so filled and so becoming. In pure white robes, like very sanctity, she did approach my cabin where I lay. Thrice bowed before me and gasping to begin some speech, her eyes became two spouts. The fury spent, anon did this break from her. Good Antigonus, since fate against thy better disposition hath made thy person for the thrower out of my poor babe, according to thine oath, places of remote enough are in Bohemia. There weep and leave it crying, and for the babe is counted a, and for the babe is counted as lost forever. Perdita, I prithee call it, for this ungentle business put on thee by my lord. Thou ne'er shalt see thy wife Paulina more. And so with shrieks, she melted into air. Right much, I did come in time to collect myself and thought this was so and no slumber. Dreams are toys. Yet for this once, yea, superstitiously, I will be squared by this. I do believe Hermione hath suffered death that Apollo would, this being indeed issue of King Polixenes, should here be laid, either for life or death, upon the earth of its right father. Blossom, eat thee well. Here lie. And there, thy character, there, these which may, if fortune please, both breed thee pretty and still rest thine. The storm begins. 
poor wretch, that for thy mother's fault art thus exposed to loss and what may follow. Weep I cannot, but my heart bleeds, and most accursed am I to be by oath and joy to this. Farewell. The day frowns more and more. Thou art like to have a lullaby too rough. I never saw the heavens dim by day. Savage clamor! Well, may I get aboard. This is the chase, and I am gone forever. I would, there were no age between 10 and 3 and 20, or that youth would sleep out the rest, for there's nothing in the between but getting wrenches with child, wronging the ancestry, stealing, fighting. Hark you now. Would any but these bold brains of 19 and 2 or 20 hunt in this weather? They have scared away two of my best sheep. I fear the wolf will sooner find than the master. If anywhere I have them, tis by the seaside browsing library, Ivy. Good luck and be thy will. What, what, what have we here? Mercy on us, a, a bairn, a very pretty bairn. A, a boy or a child is it, I wonder? Pretty one, a very pretty one. Sure, some scape. Though I am not bookish, I can read Waiting Gentlewoman in the Scape. This has been some stair work, some trunk work, some behind door work. They were warmer than that got this than the poor thing is here. I'll take it up for pity, yet I'll tarry till my son come. He hallowed, but even now. Whoa, ho, ho! Loa, Loa. What, art so near? If thou wilt see a thing to talk on when thou art dead and rotten, come hither. What, what, what else thou, man? I have seen two such sights, by sea and by land, but I am not to say it is a sea, for it is now the sky between the firmament and it. You cannot thrust a bodkin's point. Why, boy, how is it? I would you did, but see how it chafes, how it rages, how it takes up the shore. But that's not to the point. Oh, the most piteous cry of the poor souls, sometimes to see him and not to see him. Now the ship boring the moon with her mainmast, and anon swallowed with yeast and froth, as you thrust a cork into a hogshead. And then for the land service, to see how the bear taught out his shoulder bone, how he cried to me for help and said his name was Antigonus, a nobleman. But to make an end of the ship, to see how the sea flap dragoned it. But first, how the poor souls roared and the sea mocked them. And how the poor gentleman roared and the bear mocked him, both roaring louder than the sea or weather. Name of mercy! When was this boy? Now, now! I have not winked since I saw these sights. The men are not yet cold under the water, nor the bear half dined on the gentleman. He's at it now. Would I have been by to help the old man? Uh, I would. You had been by the ship's side to have helped her. There your charity would have lacked footing. Heavy matters, heavy matters. But look thee here, boy, now, now bless thyself. Thou metest with things dying, I with things newborn. Here's a sight for thee. Look thee, a barren cloth for a squire's child. Look thee here, take up, take up, boy, open it. So, let's see. It was told me I should be rich by the fairies. This is some changeling, open it. What's within, boy? You're a made old man. If the sins of your youth are forgiven you, you're well to live. Gold, all gold. This is fairy gold, boy, and it will prove so. Up with it, keep it close. Home, home the next way. We are lucky, boy, and so, and to be so, still requires nothing but secrecy. Let my sheep go, good, good boy. The next way home. 
go you the next way with your findings. I'll go see if the bear be gone from the gentleman and how much he have eaten. They are never cursed, but when they are hungry, if there be any of him left, I'll bury it. That's a good deed. If thou mayest discern by that which is left of him what he is, fetch me to the sight of him. Mary, will I, and you shall help me help to put him in the ground. Tis a lucky day, boy, and we'll do good deeds on it. Act four, scene one. I, that pleases some, try all, both joy and terror of good and bad that makes and unfolds error, now take upon me in the name of time to use my wings. Impute it not a crime to me or my swift passage that I slide o'er 16 years and leave the growth untried of that wide gap since it is in my power to o'erthrow law and in one self-born hour to plant and o'erwhelm custom. Let me pass the same I am ere ancient order was or that what is now received. I witness to the times that brought them in. So shall I do to the freshest things now reigning and make stale the glistering of this present as my tale now seems to it. Your patience this allowing, I turn my glass and give my scene such growing as you had slept between. Leontes leaving the effects of his fond jealousies so grieving that he shuts up himself. Imagine me gentle spectators, that I now may be in fair Bohemia. And remember well, I mentioned a son of the kings, which Florizel I now name to you, and with speed so paced to speak of Perdita, now grown in grace equal with wondering. What of her ensues I list not prophesy, but let time's news be known when tis brought forth. A shepherd's daughter, and what to her adheres, which follows after is the argument of time. Of this allow, if ever you have spent time worse ere now. If never, yet that time himself doth say, he wishes earnestly you never may. Act four, scene two. I pray thee, good Camillo, be no more importunate. Tis a sickness denying anything, a death to grant this. It is 15 years since I saw my country. Though I have for the most part been aired abroad, I desire to lay my bones there. Besides, the penitent king, my master, hath sent for me, to whose feeling sorrows I might be some allay, or I were weaned to think so, which is another spur to my departure. As thou lovest me, Camillo, wipe not out the rest of thy services by leaving me now. The need I have of thee, thine own goodness, hath made me. Better not to have had thee than thus to want thee. Thou, having made me businesses which none without thee can sufficiently manage, must either stay to execute them thyself, or take away with thee the very services thou hast done, which if I have not enough considered, as too much I cannot, to be more thankful to thee shall be my study, and my profit therein in heaping friendships. Of that fatal country, Cecilia, prithee speak no more, whose very naming punishes me with the remembrance of that penitent, as thou called him, the re and reconciled king, my brother, whose loss of his most precious queen and children are even now to be fresh lamented. Say to me, when thou sawest the, the Prince Florizel, my son, Kings are no less unhappy, their issue not being gracious, than they are in losing them when they have approved their virtues. Sir, it is three days since I saw the prince. What his happier affairs may be are to me unknown, but I have missingly noted he is of late much retired from court and is less frequent to his princely exercises than formerly he hath appeared. I have considered so much, Camillo, and with some care, so far that I have eyes under my service, which look upon his removedness, from whom I have this intelligence, that he is seldom from the house of a most homely shepherd, a man, they say, that from very nothing and beyond the imagination of his neighbors has grown into an unspeakable estate. I have heard, sir, of such a man, who hath a daughter of most rare note. 
the report of her is extended more than can be thought to begin from such a cottage. Now that's likewise part of my intelligence. But I fear the angle that plucks our son hither. Thou shalt accompany us to this place where we will not appearing what we are, have some question with a shepherd from whose simplicity I think it not uneasy to get the cause of my son's resort thither. Prithee be my present partner in the business and lay aside the thoughts of Cecilia. I willingly obey your command. My best Camillo, we must disguise ourselves. Act four, scene three. When daffodils begin to peer, with a the dark sea over the dale, why then comes in the sweet of the year, for the red blood rains in the winter's pale. I cheek leeching on the hedge, with hay the sweet birds, oh how they sing. That sets my pugging tooth on edge. For a quart of ale is a dish for a king. The lark that tear a near a chance with hay, with hay, the thrush and the jay are summer songs for me and my aunts while we lie tumbling in the hay. I have served Prince Florizel, and in my time wore three pile, but now I am out of service. But shall I go mourn for that, my dear? The pale moon shines by night, and when I wander here and there, I then do most go right. If thinkers may have leaf to live, and bear the so skin budget, then my account I well may give, and in the stocks avouch it. <sighs> my father named me Adelicus, who being, as I am, littered under mercury, but likewise a snapper up of unconsidered trifles, with dye and drab I purchased this comparison, and my revenue is the silly cheat. Gallows and knock are too powerful on the highway. Eating and hangings are terrors to me. For the life to come, I sleep out the thought of it. A prize, a prize. Let me see. Every leaven weather tods, every tod yields pound and odd shilling, 1500 shorn. What comes the wool to? If the springe hold, the cock's mine. I cannot do it without counters. Let me see, let me see. What am I to buy for our sheep shearing feast? Uh, three pounds of sugar, five pounds of currants, rice. What will the sister mine do with rice? But my father hath made her mistress of the feast, and she lays it on. She hath made me four and twenty nosegays for the shearers. I must have saffron to color the warden pies. Mace, dates, none, that's out of my note. Nutmegs, seven, a race or two of ginger, but that I may beg, uh, four pounds of prunes and as many raisins of the sun. Uh, oh, that ever I was born? Uh, in the name of me. Uh, oh, help me, help me. Pluck but off these rags and then death, death. Oh, lack, poor soul, thou hast more need of more rags to lay on thee rather than have these off. Oh, sir, the loathsomeness of them offends me more than the stripes I have received, which are mighty ones and millions. Alas, poor man, a million of beating may come to a great matter. Unrobbed, sir, and beaten, my money. And the peril tains from me, and these detestable things put upon me. What, by a horseman or a footman? Footman, sweet sir, a footman. Oh, indeed, he should be a footman by the garments he hath left. He is left with thee. If this be a horseman's coat, it hath seen very hot service. Lend me thy hand; I'll help thee. Come, lend me thy hand. Oh, good sir, tenderly. 
Oh, alas, oh, poor soul. Oh, good sir. Softly, good sir. I fear, ah, my, sir, my shoulder blade is out. How now? Can stand? Uh, uh. Softly, good sir. Dear sir, softly. You have done me a charitable office. Dost lack any money? I have a little money for thee. No, good sweet sir, no. I beseech you, sir. I have a kinsman that passed three quarters of a mile hence unto whom I was going. I shall there have money or anything I want. Offer me no money, I pray you. That kills my heart. What manner of fellow was he that robbed you? A fellow, sir, that I have known to go about with troll my dames. I knew him once, a servant of the prince. And that tell, good sir, for whichever virtues it was, but he was certainly out of the court. His vices, you would say. There's no virtue whipped out of the court. They cherish it to make it stay there, and yet it will no more but abide. Vices, I would say, sir. I know this man well. He hath been since an ape bearer, process server, and bailiff. Then he compassed the motion of the prodigal son, and married a tinker's wife within a mile where my land and living lies, and having flown over many knavish professions, he settled only in the road. Some call him Ottoman. Out upon him! He haunts wakes, fairs, and bear baitings. Very true, sir. He, sir, he. That's the rogue that put me into this apparel. Oh, not a more cowardly rogue in all Bohemia. If you had but looked big and spit at him, he'd have run. I must confess to you, sir. I am no fighter. I am false of heart that way, and that he knew. I warrant him. How do you now? Sweet, sir, much better than I was. I can stand and walk. I will even take my leave of you and pace, pace softly towards my kinsmen. Shall I bring thee on the way? No, good-faced sir, no, sweet sir. Then fare thee well. I must go buy spices for our sheep bearing. Prosper you, sweet sir. Your purse is not hot enough to purchase your spice. I'll be with you at your sheep shearing too. If I make not this cheat, bring out another, and the shearers prove sheep, let me be unrolled and my name put in the ver book of virtue. Jog on, jog on, the foot pathway, and merrily hint. The style day, a merry heart goes all the day, your sad tires in a mile late. Act four, scene four. These, your unusual weaves to each part of you does give a look to shepherdess, but Flora, peering in April's front. This, your sheep shearing is as a meeting of the petty gods and you, the queen on it. Sir, my gracious lord, to chide at your extremes it not becomes me. Oh, pardon that I name them. Your high self, the gracious mark of the land, you have obscured with a swain's wearing, and me, poor lowly maid, most goddess-like pranked up. But that our feasts in every mess have folly, and the feeders digest it with a custom, I should blush to see you so attired. Swoon, I think, to show myself a glass. Oh, I bless the time. And my good falcon made her flight across my father's ground. Now Jove afford you cause. To me the difference forges dread. Your greatness hath not been used to fear. Even now I tremble to think your father by some accident should pass this way as you did. Oh, the fates, how would he look upon, how would he look to see his work so noble, vilely bound up? What would he say? Or how should I in these my borrowed flaunts behold the sternness of his presence? Apprehend nothing but jollity. The gods themselves, humbling their desires to love, have taken the shapes of beasts upon them. Jupiter became a bull and bellowed. The green Neptune a ram bleated, and the fire-robed god 
golden Apollo, a poor humble swan. As I seem now, their transformations were never for a piece of beauty rarer, nor in a way so chaste. My desires run not before mine honor, nor my lust run hotter than my fate. Oh, but sir, your resolution cannot hold when tis opposed, as it must be, by the power of the king. One of these two must be necessities, which then will speak, that you must change this purpose, or I my life. Thou dearest Perdita, with these forced thoughts, I prithee darken not the mirth of the feast. All be thine, my fair, or not my father's, for I cannot be mine own, nor anything to any, if I be not thine. To this I am most constant, though destiny say no. Be merry, gentle, strangle such thoughts as these with anything that you behold the while. Your guests are coming. Lift up your countenance as if it were the day of celebration of that nuptial wish. We too have sworn shall come. O oh, Lady Fortune, stand you auspicious. See, your guests approach. Address yourself to entertain them sprightly, and let's be red with mirth. Fie, daughter, when my own wife lived, upon this day she was both peddler, butler, cook, both dame and servant, welcomed all, served all, would sing her song and dance her turn. Now here at the upper end of the table, now in the middle, on his shoulder and his, her face afire with labor, and the thing she took to quench it, she would each to each one sip. You are retired as if you were a feasted one and not the hostess of the meeting. Pray you, bid these unknown friends into his welcome, for it is a way to make us better friends, more known. Come, quench your blushes and present yourself that which you are, mistress of the feast. Come on, and bid us welcome to your sheep shearing, as to your good flock shall prosper. Sir, welcome. It is my father's will I should take on me the hostess ship of the day. You're welcome, sir. Grace and remembrance be to you both, and welcome to our shearing. Shepherdess, uh, a fair one are you? Well, you fit our ages with flowers of winter. Sir, the winter, the year growing ancient, not yet on summer's death, nor on the birth of trembling winter, the fairest flowers of the season are our carnations and strict gillivores, which some call nature's bastards. Of that kind are rustic gardens barren, and I care not to get slips of them. Wherefore, gentle maiden, do you neglect them? For I've heard it said there is an art which in their piedness shares with the great creating creature. Say there be, yet nature's meant better by no mean, but nature makes them mean. So over that art, which you say adds to nature, is an art that nature makes. You see, sweet maid, we marry a gentler scion to the wildest stock, and may conceive of bark of baser kind by bud of nobler race. This is an art which does men nature. Change it rather. The art itself is nature. So it is. Then make your garden rich in gillyballs and do not call them bastards. I should leave grazing were I of your flock and only live by gazing. How to last, you'd be so lean that blasts of January would blow you through and through. Now my fairest friend, I would I had some flowers of the spring that might become your time of day. Oh, these I lack to make you garlands of, and my sweet friend to strew him o'er and o'er. What, like a course? No, like a bank for love to lie and play on. Not like a course, or if not to be buried, but quick and in mine arms. Come, take your flowers. Methinks I play as I have seen them do in wits and pastorals. Sure, this robe of mine has changed my disposition. What you do still better is what is done. When you speak, sweet, I'd have you do it ever. You sing, I'd have you buy and sell so. So give me alms. Pray so, and for the ordering your affairs to sing them too. When you do dance, I wish you a wave of the sea that you might ever do nothing but that. Move still, still so, and own no other function. Each your doing, so singular in each particular, crowns what you are doing in the present deed. All your acts, queen. Oh, Doricles, your praises are too large, but that your youth and the true blood which peeps fairly through it do plainly give you out an unstained shepherd, whose wisdom I might fear, my Doricles, you wooed me the false way. I think you have 
a little skill to fear as I have purpose to put you to. But come, our dance, I pray, your hand, my Perdita. The turtles pair that never mean to part. I'll swear for them. This is the prettiest lowborn lass that ever ran on the greensward. Nothing she does or seems but smacks of something greater than herself. Too noble for this place. He tells her something that makes her blood look out. A good sooth, she is the queen of curds and cream. Ah, pray, pray, good shepherd, what fair swain is this which dances with your daughter? They call him Doricles and boasts himself to have a worthy feeding. But I have it upon his own report, and I believe it. He looks like sooth. He says he loves my daughter. I think so too, for never, never gaze the moon upon the water as he'll stand and read as twere my daughter's eyes. And, to be plain, I think there is not half a kiss to choose who loves another best. She dances featly. So she does anything, though I report it that should be, sh should be silent. If young Doricles do light upon her, she shall bring him that which he do not Dreams not of. Moon as white as driven snow, cypress black as air was crow, gloves as sweet as damask roses, masks for faces and for noses, bugle bracelet, necklace, amber, perfume for a lady's chamber, golden horse and stomach cursed, for my life to give their dears pins and poking sticks of steel, what maids lack from head to heel. Come by of me, come, come by, come by, buy that or else your lasses cry. Come by. Have I not told thee all how I was cousined by the way and lost all my money? And indeed, sir, there are cousiners abroad, therefore it behooves men to be wary. Fear not thou, man, thou shalt lose nothing here. I hope so, sir, for I have about me many parcels of change. What hast here? Pallets? I love a ballad in print to life, for then we are sure they are true. There's one to a very doleful tune how a usurer's wife was brought to bed of 20 money bags out of burden, and how she longed to eat adder's heads and toad's tornado. Is it true, thank you? Very true, and but a month old. Oh, come on, lay it by. We'll have this song out anon by ourselves. My father and the gentleman are in sad talk, and will not trouble them. Come, bring away thy pack after me. And you shall pay well for them. Will you buy any tape or lace for your cape, my dainty duck, my dear A? Any silk, any thread, any toys for your head of the newest and finest, finest wear A? Come to the peddler, money's a meddler that doth utter all men's worry. Away! We'll, we'll none on it. Here has been too much homely foolery already. I know, sir. We weary you. You weary those that refresh us. Is it not too far gone? It is time to part them. He's, he's simple and tells much. How now, fair shepherd? Your heart is full of something that does take your mind from feasting. Sooth, when I was young and handed love, as you do, I was wont to load my she with knacks. I would have ransacked the peddler's silken treasury and have poured it to her acceptance. You've let him go and nothing marted with him. If your lass interpretation should abuse and call this your lack of love or bounty, you were strained straighted for reply, at least if you make a care of having holding her. Old sir, I know she prizes not such trifles as these are. The gifts she looks from me are packed and locked up in my heart, which I have given already, but not delivered. Oh, hear oh, me she... breathe my, oh, sorry. Hear me breathe my life before this ancient sir, who, it should seem, have sometime loved. I take thy hand, his hand. 
How prettily the young work swain seems to wash the hand that was fair before. I've put you out, but to your proud station, let me hear what you profess. Do it, and be witness to it. And my neighbor too? And he, and more than he, and men, and the earth, the heavens, and all, that I were crowned the most imperial monarch, thereof most worthy, were I the fairest youth that ever made I swerve, had force and knowledge more than was ever man's, I would not prize them without her love. For her employ them all, commend them and condemn them to her service, or to their own perdition. Fairly offered. This shows a sound affection. But my daughter, say you the like to him? I cannot speak so well, nothing so well, no nor mean better. By the pattern of my own thoughts, I cut out the purity of his. Take hands, a bargain, and friends unknown, you shall bear witness to it. I give my daughter to him and wait, will make her portion equal his. So oh, that must be in the virtue of your daughter. One being dead, I shall have more than you can dream of yet. Enough then for your wishes, but come on. Contact us for these witnesses. Come, your hand, and daughter, yours. And soft swain, a while beseech you. Have you a father? I have, but what of him? Knows he of this? He neither does nor shall. Methinks a father is at the nuptial of his son, a guest that best becomes the table. Pray you once more. Is not your father grown incapable of reasonable affairs? Is he not stupid with age and altering rooms? Can he speak, hear, no man from man, dispute his own estate? Lies he not bedrid, and again does nothing but what he did being childish? No, good sir. He has his health and ampler strength indeed than most have of his age. By my white beard, you offer him, if this be so, a wrong something unfilial reason my son should choose himself a wife but as good reason the father all whose joy is nothing else but fair posterity should hold some counsel in such a business i yield all this but for some other reasons my grace sir which tis not fit you know i not acquaint my father of this business let him know it shall not Will he let him no he must not let him, my son. He shall not need to grieve at knowing of thy choice. Come, come, he must not. Mark our contracts. Mark your divorce, young sir, whom son I dare not call. Thou art too base to be acknowledged. Thou, a scepter's heir, that thus affects a sheep hook? Ha <laughs> ha! Thou old traitor, I am sorry that by hanging thee I could but shorten thy life one week. And thou fresh piece of excellent witchcraft, whom force must know the royal fool thou copst with. No, oh, my heart. I'll have thy beauty scratched with briars and made more homely than thy state. For thee, fond boy, if I may ever know thou dost but sigh that thou more, no more shalt see this knack, as never I mean thou shalt, we'll bar thee from succession. Not hold thee of our blood, no, not our kin. Far in the, the Ducalion off. Mark thou my words. Follow us to the court. Thou, churl, for this time, though full of our displeasure, yet we free thee from the dead blow of it. And you, enchantment, worthy enough a herdsman, yea, him too that makes himself, but for our honor therein, unworthy thee. If ever... Henceforth, thou, those rural latches to his entrance open, or hoop his body more with thy embraces, I will devise a death as cruel for thee as thou art tender to it. Even here undone, I was not much afeard. For once or twice I was about to speak and tell him plainly, the selfsame sun that shines upon his court hides not his visage from our cottage, but looks on alike. Will it please you, sir, be gone? I told you what would come of this. Beseech you of your own state, take care. This dream of mine being now awake, I'll queen it no inch further, but milk my eyes and weep. 
Why, how now, father, uh, speak ere thou diest. I cannot speak, nor think, nor dare to know that which I know. Oh, sir, you have undone a man of four score three that thought to fill his grave in quiet, yea, to die upon the bed my father died, to lie close by his honest bones. But now some hangman must put on my shroud and lay me where no priest shovels in dust. Oh, cursed wretch, thou knewest this was the prince, and thou wouldst adventure to mingle faith with him. Undone, undone. If I might die within the hour, I have lived to die when I desire. Why look you so upon me? I am but sorry, not afeard, delayed, but nothing altered. What I was, I am. More straining on for plucking back, not following my leash unwillingly. Uh, gracious, my lord, you know your father's temper? At this time, he will allow no speech, which I do guess you do not purpose to him, and as hardly will he endure your sight as yet, I fear. Then, till the fury of his highness settle, come not before him. I not purpose it. I think, Camilla. <sighs> Even he, my lord. How often have I told you twould be thus? How often said my dignity would last but till twere known? It cannot fail but by the violation of my faith, and then let nature crush the sides of the earth together and mar the seeds within. Lift up thy looks, for my succession wipe me, father. I am her heir to my affection. Be advised. I am, and by my fancy, if I may reason, will thereto be obedient. I have reason. If not, my sense is better pleased with madness, did it, it well. This is desperate, sir. Don't call it, it does not fulfill my vow. I needs must think it honesty, Camillo. Not for Bohemia, nor the pomp that made thee thereat glean, for all the sun seas, or the close, close earth wombs, or the profound seas uh, hides, in unknown fathoms, will I break my oath to this my fair beloved. Therefore I pray you, as you have e ever been my father's honored friend, when he shall miss me, as in faith I mean not to see him any more, Cast your good counsels upon his passion. Let myself and fortune tug for the time to come. This you may know, and so deliver. I am put to sea with her who here I cannot hold on shore. Most opportune to our need, I have a vessel rides fast by, but not prepared for this design. The course I mean to hold shall nothing benefit your knowledge, nor concern me the report. Oh, my lord, I would your spirit were easier for advice or stronger for your need. Hark, Perdita, I'll bear you by and by. He's irremovable, resolved for flight. Now were I happy if his going I could frame to serve my turn. Save him from danger, do him love and honor. Purchase the sight again of dear Cecilia and that unhappy king, my master, whom I so much thirst to see. Now, good Camillo, I am so fraught with curious business that I leave out ceremony. Uh, sir, I think you have heard of my poor services, the love that I have borne your father? Very nobly have you deserved it. It is my father's music to speak your deeds, not little of his care to have them recompensed as we just thought on. Well, my lord, if you may please to think I love the king and through him what's nearest to him, which is your gracious self, Embrace but my direction. If your more ponderous and settled project may suffer alteration, on mine honor, I'll point you where you shall have such receiving as shall become your highness, where you may enjoy your mistress, from the whom I see there's no disjunction to be made, but by his heavens forfend your ruin, marry her. And with my best endeavors in your absence, your discontenting father strive to qualify and bring him up to liking. How, Camillo, may this almost a miracle be done, that I may call thee something more than man, and after that trust to thee. Have you thought on a place where to you'll go? Not any yet. But as the unthought of accidents is guilty to what we wildly do, 
though we profess ourselves to be the slaves of chance and flies of every wind that blows. Then listen to me. This follows. If you will not change your purpose, but undergo this flight, make for Sicilia, and there present yourself and your fair princess, for so I see she must be for the antes. She shall be habited as it becomes the partner of your bed. Methinks I see the auntie's opening his free arms and weeping his welcomes forth, asks thee, the son, forgiveness. As t'were the father's person, kisses the hands of your fresh princess. O'er and o'er divides him twixt his unkindness and his kindness. The one he chides to hell and bids the other grow faster than thought or time. Worthy Camillo, what color for my visitation shall I hold up before him? Sent by the king your father to greet him and to give him comforts. Sir, the manner of your bearing towards him with what you as from your father shall deliver, things known betwixt us three, I'll write you down. The witch shall point you forth at every sitting what you must say, that he shall not perceive, but that you have your father's bosom there and speak his very heart. I am bound to you. There is some sap in this. A course more promising than a wild dedication of yourselves to unpathed waters, undreamed shores, most certain to miseries enough. No hope to help you, but as you shake off one to take another, nothing so certain as your anchors who do their best office if they can but stay you where you'll be loath to be. Besides, you know prosperity is the very bond of love whose fresh complexion and whose heart together affliction alters, alters. When of these is true, I think affliction may subdue the cheek but not take in the mind. Yea, say you so? There shall not be at your father's house these seven years be born another such. My good Camillo, she's as forward of her breeding as she is in the rear of our birth. I cannot say tis pity she lacks instructions, for she seems a mistress to most that teach. Your pardon, sir. For this, I'll bless you thanks. My prettiest courtesy. But oh, the thorns we stand upon. Camillo, preserver of my father, now of me. The medicine of our house, how shall we do? We are not furnished like Bohemia's son, nor shall I appear in Sicilia. My lord, fear none of this. I think you know my fortunes do all lie there. It shall be so my care to have you royally appointed as if the scene you play were mine. For instance, sir, that you may know you shall not want one word. <laughs> what a fool honesty is and trust his sworn brother, a very simple gentleman. I have sold all my trumpery. They throng who should buy first as if my trinkets had been hollowed and, bought and brought a, a benediction to the buyer. By which means I saw whose purse was best in picture, and what I saw to my good use I remembered. You might have pinched a placket. It was senseless. It was nothing to geld a cod piece of a purse. I could have filed keys off that hung in chains. No hearing, no feeling, but my sir's song and admiring the nothing of it. So that in this time of lethargy, I picked and cut most of their festival purses. Had not the old man come in with a hubbub against his daughter and the king's son and scared my chops away from the chaff, I had not a, left a purse alive in the whole army. Nay, but my letters, by this means, being there so soon as you arrive shall clear that debt. And those that you'll procure from King Leontes shall satisfy your father. Happy be you. All that you speak shows fair. Who have we here? We'll make an instrument of this. Omit nothing may give us aid. They have overheard me now. Why, hanging? How now, good fellow? Why shakest thou so? Fear not, man. Here's no harm intended to thee. Poor fellow, sir. Why be so still? Here's nobody will steal that from thee. Yet for the outside of thy poverty, we must make an exchange. Therefore, discase thee instantly. Thou must think there's a necessity in it. And change garments with this gentleman. Though the pennyworth on his side be the worst, yet hold thee. There's some boots. Uh. Uh, 
I am a poor fellow, sir. I know you well enough. Nay, prithee dispatch. The gentleman is half laid already. Are you in earnest, sir? I smell the trick on it. A dispatch, I pray thee. Indeed, I, I have had earnest, I, I, but I cannot with conscience take it. Unbuckle, unbuckle. <sighs> Fortunate mistress, let my prophecy come home to you. You must retire yourself into some covert. Take your sweetheart's hat and pluck it o'er your brows. Muffle your face. Dismantle you and, as you can, disliken the truth of your own seeming that you may, for I do fear eyes over, to shipboard get undescribed. I see the place so lies that I must bear apart. No remedy. Have you done there? Oh. <clears throat> there. Shall I now meet my father? He would not call me son. Nay, you shall have no hat. Uh, come, lady, come. Farewell, my friend. Adieu, sir. Oh, Perdita, what have we twain forgot? Pray you a word. What I do next shall be to tell the king of this escape and whither they are bound, wherein my hope is I shall so prevail to force him after, in whose company I shall review Cecilia for whose sight I have a woman's longing. Fortune speed us. Thus we set on. Camillo to the seaside. The swifter speed, the better. I understand the business. I hear it. To have an open ear, a quick eye, and a nimble hand is necessary for a cut purse. A good nose is requisite also. Smell out work for the other senses. See, this is the time that the unjust man doth thrive. What an exchange had this been without boot? What a boot is here with this exchange? Sure, the gods do this year connive with us, and we may do anything ex extempore. The prince himself is about a piece of iniquity. Stealing away from his father with his clog at his ear. If I thought it were a piece of honesty to acquaint the king with all, I would not do it. I hold it the more knavery to conceal it, and therein am I constant to my profession. I decide. Here is more matter for a hot brain. Every lane's end, every shop session hanging yields a careful man work. See? See what a man you are now. There is no other way but to tell the king she's a changeling and none of your flesh and blood. Nay, but hear me. Nay, but hear me. Go to then. She being none of your flesh and blood, your flesh and blood has not offended the king. And so your flesh and blood is not to be punished by him. Show, the, show those things you found about her, those secret things, all but what she has with her. This being done, let the law go whistle, I warrant you. I will tell the king all, every word, yea, and his son's pranks, too, who I may say is no honest man, neither to his father nor to me, to go about to make me the king's brother-in-law. <laughs> Indeed, brother-in-law was the farthest off you could have been to him, and then your blood had been the dearer by I know how much an ounce. Very wisely, puppies. Well, let us to the king. There is that in this fartle that will make him scratch his beard. I know not what impediments this complaint be to the flight of my master. Pray heartily he be at the palace. Though I am not naturally honest, I am so sometimes by chance. Let me pocket up my peddler's excrement. How now, rustics? Whither are you bound? To the palace, and it in it like your worship. Your affairs there? What? With whom? The condition of that fardel? The place of your dwelling? In your names, your ages, of what's having, breeding, and anything that is fitting to be known. Discover! We are but plain fellows, sir. A lie. You are rough and hairy. Let me have no lying. It becomes none but tradesmen, and they often give us soldiers the lie. But we pay them for it with stamped coin, not stabbing steel. Therefore, they do not give us the lie. 
your worship had liked to have given us one, if you had not taken yourself with the manor. Are you a courtier and like you, sir? Whether it's like me or no, I am a courtier. Seest thou not the air of the court in these unfoldings? Hath not my gait in it the measure of the court? Receives not thy nose court odor from me? Reflect I not on thy bed. My business, sirs, to the king. I command thee to open thy affair. My business, sirs, to the king. What advocate hast thou to him? I know not, and it like you. How blessed we are, are we that are not simple men. Yet nature might have made me as these are, therefore I will not disdain. This cannot be but a great courtier. His garments are rich, but he wears them not handsomely. He seems to be more noble in being fantastical. A great man, I'll warrant, I know by the pickings of his aunt's teeth. The fardle there. What say the fardle? Wherefore that box? Sir? There lies such secrets in this fardle that, and box which none hath known but the king, and which he shall know within this hour if I may come to the speech of him. H, thou hast lost thy labor. Why, sir? King is not at the palace. He is gone aboard a new ship to purge melancholy and air himself, or if thou beest capable of things serious, thou must know king is full of grief. So to said, sir, about his son that should have married a shepherd's daughter. If that shepherd be not in hand fast, let him fly. The curses he shall have, the torches he shall feel, will break the back of man, the heart of monster. Think you so, sir? Not he alone shall suffer what wit can make heavy and vengeance bitter, but those that are germane to him, though removed fifty times, shall all come under the hangman, which, though it be great pity, yet it is necessary. An old sheep whistling rogue, a ram tender, to offer to have his daughter come into grace. Some say he shall be stoned, but that death is too soft for him, say I. All deaths are too few, sharpest, too easy. Has the old man e'er a son, sir? Do you hear? And it like you, sir? He has a son, who shall be flayed alive, then anointed over with honey, set on the head of a wasp's nest, then stand till he be three quarters and a dram dead, then recovered again with aqua vitae or some other hot infusion, then raw as he is, and in the hottest day prognostication proclaims, shall he be set against the brick wall, the sun looking with the southward eye upon him, where he is to behold him with flies blown to death. What talk we of these traitorly rascals, whose miseries are to be smiled at, their offenses being so capital? Tell me, for you seem to be plain, honest men, what you have to the king. Being something gently considered, I'll bring you where he is aboard. Enter your persons to his presence. Whisper him in your behalfs, and if it be in man besides the king to effect your suits, here is man shall do it. He seems to be of great authority. Close with him, give him gold, and though authority be a stubborn bear, yet he is oft led by the nose with gold. Show the inside of your purse to the outside of his hand, and no more ado. Remember, stoned and flayed alive. And it please you, sir, to undertake the business for us. Here is that gold I have. I'll make it as much more and, and leave this young man in pawn till I bring it you. After I have done what I promised? Aye, sir. Well, give me the moiety. 
Are you party in this business? In some sort, sir, but though my case be a pitiful one, I hope I shall not be played out of it. Oh, that's the case of the shepherd's son. Hang him, he'll be made an example. Oh, comfort, good comfort. We must to the king and show our strange sights. He must know tis none of your daughter nor my sister. We are gone else, sir. I will give you as much as this old man does when the business is performed and remain, as he says, your pawn till it be brought you. I will trust you. Walk before toward the seaside. Go the right hand. I will but look upon the hedge and follow you. Oh, we are blessed in this man, as I may say, even blessed. Let's before, as he bids us, he was provided to do us good. I had the mind to be honest. I see fortune would not suffer me. She drops booties in my mouth. I am courted now with the double occasion, gold and the means to do the prince my master good. Who knows how that may turn back to my advancement. I will bring these two moles, these blind ones, aboard him. If he think it fit to shore them again, and that's the complaint they have to the king concerns him. No. Let him call me rogue for being so far officious, for I am proof against that title, and what shame else belongs to it. To him will I present them. There may be matter in it. Act five, scene one. Sir, you have done enough and have performed a saint-like sorrow. No fault could make you what you have not redeemed. Indeed, paid down more patience than done trespass. At last, do as the heavens have done. Forget your evil. With them, forgive yourself. Whilst I remember her and her virtues, I cannot forget my blemishes in them. And so still think of the wrong I did myself which was so much that airless it hath made my kingdom and destroyed the sweetest companion that e'er man bred his hopes out of. True, too true, my lord. If one by one you wedded all the world or from the all that are took something good to make a perfect woman, she you killed would be unparalleled. I think so. Killed. She I killed. I did so, but thou strikest me, sorely to say I did. It is as bitter upon thy tongue as in my thought. Now, good now, say so, but seldom. Not at all, good lady. You might have spoken a thousand things that would have done the times more benefit and graced your kindness better. You are one of those would have him wed again. If you would not so, you pity not the state, nor the remembrance of his most sovereign name. Consider little what dangers by his highness's fail of issue may drop upon his kingdom and devour. In certain lookers on, what were more holy than to rejoice the former queen as well? What holier than for royalty's repair, for present comfort and for future good to bless the bed of majesty again with the sweet fellow to it? There is none worthy respecting her that's gone. Besides, the gods will have fulfilled their secret purposes. For has not the divine Apollo said, is not the tenor of his oracle, that King Leontes shall not have an heir till his lost child be found? Which that it shall is as all monstrous to our human reason as my Antigonus to break his grave and come again to me, who on my life did perish with the infant. Tis your counsel, my Lord, should to the heavens be contrary, oppose against their wills care not for issue. The crown will find an heir. Great Alexander left his to the worthiest, so his successor was like to be the best. Good Paulina, Paulinia, who has the memory of Hermione, I know in honor, oh, that ever I had squared me to thy counsel. Then even now I might have looked upon my queen's full eyes, have taken treasure from her lips. And left them more rich for what they yielded. Thou speakest truth. No more such wives, therefore no wife. One worse and better used would make her sainted spirit again possess her corpse. And on this stage where we offenders now appear soul vexed and begin 
Why to me? Had she such power, she had just cause. She had, and would incense me to murder her I married. I should so. Were I the ghost that walked, I'd bid you mark her eye and tell me for what dull part in it you chose her. Then I'd shriek that even your ears should rift to hear me and the words that followed should be, remember mine. Stars, stars, and all eyes else dead coals. Fear thou no wife. I'll have no wife, Polinia. Will you swear never to marry but by my free leave? Never, Polinia. So be blessed, my spirit. Then, good my lords, bear witness to his oath. You tempt him overmuch. Unless another as like Hermione as is her picture affronts his eye. Good madam. I have done. Yet, if my lord will marry, if you will, sir, no remedy, but you will give me the office to choose you a queen. She shall not be so young as was your former, but she shall be such as walked your first queen's ghost. It should take joy to see her in your arms. My true Paulinia, we shall not marry till thou biddest us. That shall be when your first queen's again in breath. Never till then. One that gives out himself Prince Florizel, son of Pol Polixenes, with his princess, she the fairest I have yet beheld, desires access to your high presence. What with him? He comes not like to his father's greatness. His approach, so out of circumstance and sudden, tells us tis not a visitation framed, but forced by need and accident. What train? But few, and those but mean. His princess, say you, with him? I, the most peerless piece of earth, I think, that e'er the sun shone bright on. O oh, Hermione, as every present time doth boast itself above a better gone, so must thy grave give way to what's seen now. Miss, you yourself have said and writ so, but your writing now is colder than that theme. She had not been nor was not to be equaled. Thus your verse flowed with her beauty once. Tis shrewdly ebbed to say you have seen a better. Pardon, madam. The one I have almost forgot, your pardon. The other, when she has obtained your eye, will have your tongue too. This is a creature, would she begin a sect, might quench the zeal of all professors else, make proselytes of who she but bid follow. How, not women? Women will love her that she is a woman more worth than any man. Men, that she is the rarest of all women. Go, Cleomenes, uh, yourself, assisted with your honored friends. Bring them to our embracement. Still, tis strange he thus should steal upon us. Had our prince, jewel of children, seen this hour, he had paired well with this lord. There was not a, there was not full a month between their births. Prithee, no more cease. Thou knowest he dies to me again when talked of. Sure. When I shall see this gentleman, thy speeches will bring me to consider that which may unfurnish me of reason. They are come. Your mother was most true to wedlock, Prince, for she did print your royal father off, conceiving you. Were I but twenty-one, your father's image is so hit in you, his very heir, that I should call you brother, as I did him, and speak of something wildly by us performed before. Most dearly welcome, and your fair princess, goddess. Oh, alas, I lost a couple that twixt heaven and earth might thus have stood, begetting wonder, as you, gracious couple, do. And then I lost all mine own folly, the society, amity, too, of your brave father, whom, though bearing misery, I desire my life once more to look on him. By his command, have I here touched Cecilia, and from him give you all greetings that a king, at friend, can send his brother. And but infirmity, which waits upon worn times, hath something seized his wished ability, he had himself, the land and waters twixt your throne and his, measured to look upon you. And he loves, he bade me say so, more than all the scepters and those that bear them living. Oh, my brother, good gentleman. 
the wrongs I have done thee stir afresh within me, and, and these offices so rarely kind are as interpreters of my behinded, be, behindhand slackness. Welcome hither, as is the spring of the earth, and hath he too exposed this paragon to the fearful usage, at least ungentle, of the dreadful Neptune, to greet a man not worth her pains, much less the adventures of her person? Good, my lord. She came from Libya. Where the warlike Smallus, that noble honored lord, is feared and loved? Most royal, sir, from thence, from him, whose daughter his tears proclaimed his parting with her. Thence, a prosperous south wind friendly, we have crossed to execute the charge my father gave me for visiting your highness. My best train I have from your Sicilian shores dismissed, who for Bohemia bend to signify not only my success in Libya, sir, but my arrival and my wife's in safety. Here is where we are. The blessed gods purge all infection from our air whilst you do climate here. You have a holy father, a great full gentleman, against whose person so sacred as it is, I have done sin, for which the heavens taking angry note have left me issueless. And your father's blessed as he from heaven merits it with you, worthy his goodness. What might I have been, might I a son and daughter now have looked on such goodly things as you? Most noble sir, that which I shall report will bear no credit were it not the proof so nigh. Please you, great sir. Bohemia greets you from himself by me, desires you to attack his son who has, his dignity and duty both cast off, fled from his father, from his homes, and with a shepherd's daughter. Where's Bohemia? Speak. Here in your city. I now came from him. I speak amazedly, and it becomes my marvel and my message. To your court, whilst he was hastening, in the chase, it seems, of his this fair couple, meets he on the way, the father of this seeming lady and her brother, having both their country quitted with this young prince. Camillo has betrayed me, whose honor and whose honesty till now endured all weathers. Let's so to his charge. He's with the king, your father. Who? Camillo? Camillo, sir. I spake with him, who now has these four men in question. Never saw I wretched so quake. They kneel, they kiss the earth, forswear themselves as often as they speak. Bohemia stops his ears and threatens them with diverse deaths in death. Oh, my poor father, the heavens that spies upon us will not have our contract celebrated. You are married. Uh, we are not, sir, nor are we like to be. The stars I see will kiss the valleys first, the odds for high and lows alike. My lord, is this the daughter of a king? She is, when once she is my wife. That once, I see, by your good father's speed, will come on very slowly. I am sorry, most sorry, you have broken from his liking, where you were tied in duty, and as sorry, your choice is not so rich in worth as beauty, that you might well enjoy her. Dear, look up. Though fortune, visible and enemy, should chase us with my father, Power no jot hath she to change our loves. Beseech you, sir, remember since you've owed no more to time than I do now. With thought of such affections, step forth my advocate. At your request, my father will grant precious things as trifles. Would he do so? I'd beg your pre precious mistress, which he counts but a trifle. Sir, my liege, your eye hath too much youth in it. Not a month for your queen died, she was more worth such gazes than what you look on now. I thought of her even in these looks I made. But your petition is yet unanswered. I will to your father. Your honor, not overthrown by your desires, I am friend to them and you, upon which errand I now go toward him. Therefore follow me, and mark what way I make. Come, good, my lord. Act five, scene two. I teach you, sir. Were you present at this relation? I was, by at the opening of the fardel, I heard the old shepherd delivered the manner how he found it, whereupon 
After a little amazingness, we were all commanded out of the chamber. Only this methought I heard the shepherd say, he found the child. <clears throat> I would most gladly know the issue of it. I make a broken delivery of the business, but the changes I perceived in the king and Camilla were very notes of admiration. They seemed almost with staring in one another to tear the cases of their eyes. There was speech in their dumbness, language in their very gesture. They looked as if they had heard of a world ransomed or one destroyed. A notable passion of wonder appeared in them, but the wisest beholder then knew no more, but seeing could not say if the importance were joy or sorrow, but in the extremity of the what it must needs be. Here comes a gentleman that happily knows more. What news, Cleomenes? Nothing but bonfires. The oracle is fulfilled. The king's daughter is found. Such a deal of wonder is broken out within this hour that ballad makers cannot be able to express it. Ah, here comes the Lady Polina's maid. She can deliver you more. How goes it now, sir? This news which is called so true is so like an old tale that the verity of it is in strong suspicion. Has the king found his heir? Most true, if ever truth were pregnant by circumstance. The which you hear, you'll swear you see. There is such unity in the proofs. The mantle of Queen Hermione's, her jewel about the neck of it. The letters of Antigonus found with it, which they know to be his character the majesty of the creature in resemblance of the mother, the affection of nobleness which nature shows above her breeding, and many other evidences proclaim her with all certainty to be the king's daughter. Did you see the meeting of the two kings? No. Then you have lost a sight which was to be seen, cannot be spoken of. There might, there might you have beheld one joy crown another, so and in such manner that it seems sorrow wept to take leave of them for their joy waited in tears. There was casting up of eyes, holding up of hands, with countenance of such distraction that they were to be known by garment, not by favor. Our king, being ready to leap out of himself for joy of his found daughter, as if that joy were now become a lost cries, oh, thy mother, thy mother, then asks Bohemia forgiveness, then embraces his son-in-law, then again worries he his daughter with clipping her. Now he thanks the old shepherd, which stands by like a weather-bitten conduit of many kings' reigns. I never heard of such another encounter, which lames report to follow it and undoes description to do it. What, what pray you became of Antigonus that carried hence the child? Like an old tale still, which will have matter to rehearse though, though credit be asleep and not an ear open. He was torn to pieces with a bear. This avouches the shepherd's son who has not only his innocence, which seems much to justify him, but a handkerchief and rings of his that Paulina knows. What became of his bark and his followers? Racked the same instance of their master's death and in the view of the shepherd, so that all the instruments which aided to expose the child were even then lost when it was found. But oh, the noble combat that twixt joy and sorrow was fought in Polina. She had one eye declined for the loss of her husband, another elevated that the oracle was fulfilled. She lifted the princess from the earth and so locks her in embracing as if she would pin her to her heart that she might no more be in danger of losing. The dignity of this act was worth the audience of kings and princes for by such it was acted. One of the prettiest touches of all and that which angled for mine eyes caught the water though not the fish was when at the relation of the queen's death with the manner how she came to bravely confessed and lamented by the king, how attentiveness wounded his daughter till from one sign of dolor to another she did with an alas, I would say, I would fain say bleed tears for I am sure my heart wept blood. Who was most marble there changed color. Some swooned all sorrowed. If all the world could have seen it, the woe had been universal. Are they returned to the court? No. The princess, hearing of her mother's statue, which is in the keeping of Paulina, a piece many years in doing and now newly performed by that rare Italian master, Julio Romano, who had he himself eternity and could put breath into his work, would beguile nature of her custom. So perfectly he is her ape. He so near to Hermione, hath done Hermione, that they say one would speak to her and stand in hope of answer. Thither with all greediness of affection are they gone, and there they intend to sup. I thought she had some great matter there in hand, for she hath privately twice or thrice a day ever since the death of Hermione visited that removed house. 
shall we thither and with our company peace the rejoicing? Who would be thence that has the benefit of access? Every wink of an eye, some new grace will be born. Our absence makes us unthrifty to our knowledge. Let's along. Now, had I not the dash of my former life in me, could preferments drop on my head? I brought the old man and his son aboard the prince, told him, told him I heard them talk of a fardel, and I know not what. But he at that time, over fond of the shepherd's daughter, so he then took her to be, who began to be much seasick, and him little better, extremity of weather continuing, this mystery remained undiscovered. But it is all one to me, for had I been the finder out of this secret, it would not have relished among my other discredits. Here come those I have done good to against my will, and already appearing in the blossoms of their fortune. Come, boy, I am past more children, but thy sons and daughters will be, will all gentlemen born. You are well met, sir. You denied to fight with me this other day because I was no gentleman born. See you these clothes? Say you see them not and think me still no gentleman born. You were best say these robes are not gentlemen born. Give me the lie, do, and try whether I am not now a gentleman born. I know you are now, sir. A gentleman born. I and have been so any time these four hours. <laughs> and so have I, boy. So you have. But I was a gentleman born before my father. For the king's son took me by the hand and called me brother. And then the two kings called my father brother. And then the prince my brother. And the princess my sister called my father father. And so we wept. And there was the first gentleman, there was the first gentleman like tears that ever we shed. We may live, son, to shed many more. Ay, or else to our hard luck, being in so preposterous a state as we are. I humbly beseech you, sir, pardon me all the faults I have committed to your worship, and to give me your good report to the prince, my master. Pretty son, do, for we must be gentle now we are gentlemen. Thou wilt amend thy life? Aye, and it's like your good worship. Give me thy hand. I will swear to the prince thou art in as honest a true fellow as any in Bohemia. You may say it, but not swear it. Not swear it? Now I am a gentleman. Let Boris and Franklin say it. I'll swear it. How if it be false, son? If it be ne'er so false, a true gentleman may swear it in the behalf of his friend, and I'll swear to the prince thou art a tall fellow of thy hands, and that thou wilt not be drunk, but I know thou art no tall, tall fellow of thy hands, and that thou wilt be drunk, but I'll swear it, and I would thou wouldst be a tall fellow of thy hands. I will prove so, sir, to my power. I, by any means, prove a tall fellow. If I do wonder how thou darst venture to be drunk, not being a tall fellow, trust me not. Hark, the king and, and princes, our kindred, are going to see the queen's picture. Come, follow us. We'll be thy good masters. Act five, scene three. Oh, grave and good Paulina, the great comfort that I have had of thee what sovereign sir i did not well i meant well all my services you have paid home but that you have vouchsafed with your crowned brother and these your contracted heirs of your kingdoms my poor house to visit it is a surplus of your grace which never my life may last to answer oh paulina we honor you with trouble but we came to see the statue of our queen your gallery have we passed through not without much content and many singularities but we saw not that which my daughter came to look upon the statue of her mother. As she lived peerless, so her dead likeness, I do well believe, excels whatever yet you looked upon or hand of man hath done. Therefore, I keep it lonely apart. But here it is. Prepare to see the life as lively mocked as ever still sleep mocked death. Behold and, and say tis well. I like your silence. 
it the more shows off your wonder. But yet speak, first you, my liege, comes it not something near? Her natural posture. Chide me, dear stone, that I may say indeed thou art Hermione, or, or rather that thou art uh, she in thy not chiding. She was as tender as infancy and grace, but yet Paulina, Hermione was not so much wrinkled, nothing so aged as this seems. Oh, not by much. So much the more our carver's excellence, which lets go by some 16 years and makes her as she lived now. As now she might have done. So much to my good comfort as it is now piercing to my soul. Oh, thus she stood, even with such life of majesty, warm life, as now it coldly stands. When first I wooed her, I am ashamed. Does not the stone rebuke me for being more stone than it? Oh, royal peace, there's magic in thy majesty, which has my evils conjured to remembrance, and from thy admiring daughter took the spirits, standing like stone with thee. And give me leave, and do not say to superstition that I kneel, and then implore her blessing. Lady, dear queen that ended when I but began, give me that hand of yours to kiss. Oh, patience. The statue is but newly fixed, the color's not dry. My lord, your sorrow was too sore laid on, which sixteen winters cannot blow away, so many summers dry. Scarce any joy did ever so long live. No sorrow but killed itself much sooner. Dear my brother, let him that was the cause of this have power to take off so much grief from you as he will peace up in himself. Indeed, my lord, if I had thought the sight of my poor image would thus have wrought you, for the stone is mine, I'd not have showed it. Do not draw the curtain. No longer shall you gaze on it, lest your fancy may think anon it moves. Let it be, let be. Would I were dead, but that me thinks already. What was he that did make it? See, my lord, will you not have deemed it breathed, and that those veins did verily bear blood? Masterly done. The very life seems to warm upon her lip. The fixture of her eye has motion in it, as we are mocked with art. I'll draw the curtain. My lord's almost so far transported that he'll think and not it lives. Oh, sweet Paulina, make me to think so 20 years together. No settled senses of the world can match the pleasure of that madness. Let it alone. I am sorry, sir. I have thus far stirred you, but I could afflict you farther. Do, Paulina, for this affliction has a taste as sweet as any cordial comfort. Still, methinks, there is an air comes from her. What fine chisel could ever yet cut breath? Let no man mock me, for I will kiss her. Good, my lord, forbear. The ruddiness upon her lip is wet. You'll mar it if you kiss it. Stain your own with oily painting. Shall I draw the curtain? No, not these 20 years. So long could I stand by a looker on. Either forbear, quit presently the chapel, or resolve you for more amazement. If you can behold it, I'll make the statue move indeed, descend and take you by the hand. But then you'll think, which I protest against, I am assisted by wicked powers. What you can make her do, I am content to look on. What to speak, I am content to hear. For tis as easy to make her speak as move. It is required you do awake your faith. Then all stand still, or those that think it is unlawful business I am about, let them depart. Proceed. No foot shall stir. Music. Awake her, strike. Tis time, descend, be stone no more. Approach, strike all that look upon with marvel. Come, I'll fill your grave up. Stir, nay, come away. Bequeath to death your numbness, for from him dear life redeems you. You perceive? She stirs. Start not. Her actions shall be as holy as you hear my spell is lawful. Do not shun her until you see her die again, for then you kill her double. Nay, present your hand. When she was young, you wooed her. Now in age, 
Is she become the suitor? Oh, she's warm. If this be magic, let it be an art lawful as eating. She embraces him. She hangs about his neck. If she pertain to life, let her speak too. Aye, and make it manifest where she has lived, or how stolen from the dead. That she is living, were it but told you, should be hooted at like an old tale. But it appears she lives, though yet she speak not. Mark a little while. Please you to interpose, fair madam. Kneel and pray your mother's blessing. Turn, good lady, our Perdita is found. Gods, look down and from your sacred vials pour your graces upon my daughter's head. Tell me, mine own, where hast thou been preserved? Where lived? How found thy father's court? For thou shalt hear that I, knowing by Polina that the oracle gave hope, thou wast in being, have preserved myself to see the issue. There's time enough for that, lest they desire upon this push to trouble your joys with like relation. Go together, you precious winners all. Your exultation partake to everyone. I, an old turtle, will wing me to some withered bough, and there my mate, that's never to be found again, lament till I am lost. Peace, Paulina. Thou shouldst a husband take by my consent, and as I by thine a wife. This is a match, and made between by vows, thou hast found mine. But how is to be questioned? For I saw her, as I thought, dead, and have in vain said many a prayer upon her grave. I'll not seek far, for him I partly know his mind, to find thee an honorable husband. Come, Camillo, and take her by the hand, whose worthy and honesty is richly noted and here justified by us, a pair of kings. Let's from this place. What? Look upon my brother, both your pardons, that ere I put between your holy looks my ill suspicion. This your son-in-law and son unto the king, whom heaven's directing is troth plight to your daughter, good Paulina, lead us from hence, where we may leisurely each one demand an answer to his part, performed in this wide gap of time since first we were dissevered. Hastily lead away. I'm talking to a muted microphone. Hooray to everyone. Uh, what a fantastic show. You all did so fantastically. Okay. Um, I've moved us into speaker view. If everybody wants to bring their Yay. camera in, we're going to run a quick curtain call. Uh, let us begin with our youngest cast member who has gone to bed. But tonight we had Declan in the role of Mamilius and he did a fantastic job. Hooray for Declan. Uh, tonight as Oh, I'm gonna have such a hard time with names. I'm gonna try real hard, guys. <laughs> Tonight, as Autolycus and the Mariner, we had Carl. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank Sing you. Sing us a song! <laughs> he is our piano man. Uh, as Dion, we had Jeremy. Hi. <laughs> As uh, Cleomenes, I, I came in with Cleomenes. Hi, it was me. Thank you so much. Donate to the center. Um, as Amelia and Time, we had Molly. Thanks for watching. Make sure you watch Oedipus and come see as you like it. As uh, the Shepherd's son, we had Joseph. Thank you. Okay. As the Shepherd and the Servant, we had Michelle. Thanks, everyone. Good night. As Perdita and the Lord, we had Vera. Thank you. As Florizel and Archidamus, we had Kurt. Thank you all so much for watching. As Antigonus and the Messenger, we had Kelly. Thank you guys. Also, shout out to Wigglesworth the Bear and donate to the center if you can. Wigglesworth the Bear, can't forget him. As Camillo, we had Kevin. Hi, uh, thank you so much. Donate to the center. As Polixenes, we had Chris. Thanks very much. Good night. As Polina, we had Wendy. Thank you. Come see all the shows. As Hermione, we had Anna. Hello, everybody. Have a great night. And as Leontes, we had Austin.
Thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, support local theater. Support local theater. So as I was starting to say at the beginning of the show, the center is currently streaming Oedipus Rx. I hear it's amazing. Make sure you get those tickets. It's this weekend and next weekend. Um, they are also going to be streaming a an improv show. So they're pre-filming and streaming an improv show. It's being filmed um, next week, I think. Uh, in front of a small live audience, it's being filmed and then they're gonna uh, do it as a streaming show. So make sure you get your tickets to see the improv show, no joke improv. Um, and then they're gonna be moving outside with the dance. Uh, they have a couple of dance performances, a dance Come recital. Come see me dance. Come see him dance at the dance recital. Um, and also, uh, As You Like It is preparing for the center and they're very busy building that outdoor stage and we are so excited about it. So make sure to check out all the things they're doing and buy tickets and go see things. Um, we have a Midsummer Night's Dream next week, and that is our season finale. We will be taking the summer off so we can all go sit outside at the center too. <laughs> so please join us next week for a Midsummer Night's Dream. We are excited to do it. Uh, and I suppose that's about it. Good night from Living Room Shakespeare. Bye.